Uh, welcome and uh, uh, thank you for joining us for the first California Bumblebee Atlas training workshop of 2024. My name is Lee Richardson. I am a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. And uh, I will be your only host this evening as my colleague Rich Hatfield from Xerces is not able to join us this evening. Um, so I hope that works out for you. Um, so we're going to have two hours of conversation um, or one-sided conversation where I uh, will talk to you, talk at you about the project. Um, we have three modules. The first is an introduction. The second is um, is is uh, the methods. And the third is introduction. Uh, sorry, identification. Um, between after each of those, we will have some time for questions. You won't be able to um, ask verbally, but uh, what I'd like you to do is type your questions into the Q&A. Um, and at the end of a section, I will go and look and answer as many as I can. So the, the first section is 20 minutes, the second is 80 minutes, and the third is 20 minutes. That's inclusive of questions. So I may move somewhat fast so that we do have time for questions. And I'll apologize in, uh, in advance if we go over by a couple of minutes, as sometimes happens. Uh, so um, without further ado, let's get started. I want to also say uh, this is a resch rescheduled uh, webinar, and um, thank you for your um, patience and forbearance. Um, with that, uh, we had multiple tech issues that all crashed into each other in the minutes before um, 6 p.m. on March 5th, and that is why we're here tonight. Um, in the un unlikely event that there's some sort of technical issue, um, stand by and I'll do my best to get us back on track, but I don't anticipate that. So um, here's module one. Introduction to the bumblebees. Um, here I'll, I'll introduce you to the basic background on these bees and um, their uh, their ecology and some of their conservation status before we then move into talking about how the project works. So first, I want to tell you that the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, my employer, um, we protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We do this through five different pro programs or project areas within the organization. Those include uh, native pollinators, endangered species, which is where the bumblebee project sits and where I work, uh, aquatic invertebrates, butterfly conservation, and pesticides. We are an evidence-based organization. We uh, use science to uh, make uh, decisions about uh, the endangerment of invertebrates and their habitat needs and so on. We do our science with a, an array of public and private partners, including academic researchers, government scientists, community scientists such as yourselves and many other folks. Uh, speaking of community science, also known as citizen science, uh, we have an array of different projects that you might be interested in other than these bumblebee atlases. Um, if you're interested in the in community science in general at Xerces, we have uh, a link at the bottom of the page here to, um, to a page on our website about this. But briefly, we do have uh, Bumblebee Atlas is going in 20 states across the US. We have Bumblebee Watch, which is a platform where people can um, submit data, whether they're part of an atlas or not. We have two projects focused on the Western Monarch Butterfly. We have a freshwater mussel survey. We have a new Firefly Atlas, and we have lots more. So please, uh, if you're interested in yet more community science, follow that link and check it out. Uh, when the science that we do, when the evidence we gather, dictates. Uh, we also advocate uh, for policies and um, for protection of endangered um, and threatened invertebrates. And um, we do a ton of education, um, forums like this, but also uh, education in the field. We do this around the nation as well as around the world. And um, during the 25 plus years that Xerces <clears throat> has been active, we have supported pollinator habitat restoration on a large number of acres of land. Uh, we do this through um, technical assistance, through habitat plantings, through restoration, uh, and other means. So that's Xerces in a nutshell. Um, if you're a member, thank you so much for joining us. And if you're not and you want to be, um, there is a, a link on this page that's partially uh, obscured, xerces.org slash donate. And that is where you go if you want to become a member. All right. So here is the outline for this evening. Module one, which we are in now, is that is the first 20 minutes, an introduction. We'll then talk about participating or the methods. We'll have a five minute break between module two and module three. And then module three is an introduction to the identification of California's bumblebees. So 
why invertebrates? Why are we here tonight talking about a small group of invertebrate species? Um, well, I, I probably don't need to say this to you all, but um, we think that the fate of the world's insects is inseparable from our own. And that's a quote from a recent publication. Um, put plainly, invertebrates perform very important roles in ecosystems and in our lives. Uh, and, uh, and these things are necessary for the life that we as humans currently live on Earth. Uh, they are very important as decomposers of, uh, of organic material. They are very important biocontrol agents in the context of agriculture, meaning that there are parasites and parasitoids that attack the pests of crops. Um, they also do this in the wild, which is a part of ecosystem health as well. Uh, They're the base of the food chain for many, um, many other organisms. For example, this trout here, I'm um, sucking down a, a mayfly perhaps. And um, fourth, uh, they're pollinators, meaning that they help plants reproduce. And this is why uh, we're here to talk about bees, among other reasons, right? Um, so uh, the the one thing that separates bees from other invertebrates in, in the in the common imagination um, is that they are pollinators, right? And they have these mutualisms with plants. A mutualism is an interaction where both uh, parties benefit from their interaction to be uh, contrasted maybe with competition where they're both both uh, uh, individual animals, let's say, could could um, suffer negative consequences from their competition, or just one might benefit. So, um, uh, so bees are very important pollinators. Uh, we would like to call them sometimes keystone species, meaning that uh, ecosystems really wouldn't function the same way without them. In fact, it's been estimated that more than 85% of flowering plants require an animal, usually an insect, for uh, maximizing their reproduction. Um, and the rest uh, have no need for animal-mediated pollination. But that's the majority of our land plants. Um, so uh, we also know that bees are critical to agriculture. They uh, account for something like 10% of the total value of agriculture, as realized by the grower, maybe. So um, that's a that's a lot of the um, the income of a farm. And um, farmers really couldn't couldn't make it without um, bees. Now, um, we usually think about honeybees as the pollinators on farms, but it turns out uh, that the majority of pollination around the world on farms is taking place um, due to wild insects, especially bees, whether or not honeybees are present. So honeybees are very important. We'll talk about them more in a minute, um, but uh, they are not necessarily the most important pollinators. In fact, it's these wild animals that are commuting to the farm to get their own food and engage in these mutualisms with crop plants. And in so doing, they are uh, allowing those plants to fruit and allowing us to eat. So there are lots of intrinsic reasons to value bees. And, um, but I've just been talking about some, some utilitarian reasons to value bees, right? They're, they're, they're valued, valuable in um, structuring ecosystems and also in um, mediating what we get to eat. So there are other pollinators that are quite important. Um, here we see a butterfly, a fly, and a moth on the top rank, and then a, a wasp, beetles, and a bee on the bottom. Um, and all of, there are many other types of pollinators, including some vertebrates, um, but far and away, the most important group of pollinators, whether vertebrate or invertebrate, is bees. And um, that's why, uh, why we're focusing so much on pollination as something that bees do. Uh, bumblebees, in particular, are wonderful pollinators. They have certain adaptations that make them better at uh, extracting pollen from flowers, moving it between flowers, um, and thus uh, allowing pollination better than some other insects. Um, so they consume nectar and pollen as larvae and adults. In fact, that's true of all bees. Um, bees are distinguished from their, their wasp and ant relatives by being vegetarians. They only eat plant parts. Um, with a few weird exceptions. Um, so nectar and pollen come from flowers and bees are stuck going to flowers, right? And, and it, so they have evolved to be um, good partners to the, to the plants, if you will, transferring pollen between male and female parts. They have an array of adaptations to harvest the pollen and then to carry it. And here we're showing, we're highlighting the pollen basket on the hind leg, uh, which is this shiny hairless area surrounded by bristles. The bee will mix pollen with nectar and make a kind of wet clump and then stick it on there and the bristles will hold it in place as the bee flies around. Um, it's important to understand that bee pollination is incidental to bee foraging. It is not the purpose of the bee, so far as we understand it. Um, this is not altruism, but the, the bee is, is selfishly looking for a meal 
the plant is selfishly looking for a pollinator and they both benefit when they interact. That's how, at least in uh, uh, biology, we see, we see these interactions. So uh, I'll mention honeybees again here, and then we'll leave them for now. Um, everybody knows what a honeybee is. And so I like to use it as a contrast for what the other bees are. So here's a picture of a honeybee on the left and a bumblebee on the right, both on the same plant in my yard, um, uh, not in California, incidentally. Um, and so honeybees are a bit smaller than the average bumblebee. They are um, sort of tan, yellow, brownish striped with darker contrasting stripes. Uh, they have, have hairy eyes, which is an interesting little thing that is unique to them. Um, and they're both social animals. The one thing that's important for you to understand is that honeybees are not native to North America or California. They came from Eurasia and Africa, and we brought them, we humans brought them here, and um, they are both managed as important crop pollinators and producers of, of hive products like honey, but also used as, as um, but are also feral. So they're found widely in California living without the aid of human beings. And in many field sites, you will run into honeybees. These are not the bees that we're um, interested in counting in this survey, but I just wanted to introduce you to them. We can talk much more about honeybees if you're interested. So let's uh, think about bumblebees as a fraction of bee diversity in general. Um, bees are really diverse. We know of about 20,500 species at this point, and more are being described all the time. This is worldwide. Um, in North America, that's about 5,200 species of native bees. In the US and Canada, we estimate about 3,600. California itself has 1,600 species of bees. So compare that to your favorite taxon, maybe it's birds or plants or something. Well, plants isn't a good example because they're so diverse in California. Uh, point is that California has a huge diversity of bees. However, bumblebees are not that diverse. Uh, we have, oops, we have um, only 265 species globally and uh, 50 or so in North America, 25 in California. So California has half of all of the species found on the continent, um, but that is just a tiny number of bees compared to other genera of bees where you have hundreds of species. So uh, bumblebees are these, uh, we like to call them charismatic um, mesofauna or macrofauna of the bee world. They're large and colorful, uh, bright hair colors. Uh, they move slowly on flowers and we can really get a sense of uh, what they're up to. And they're really, they're really quite fun to, to watch. Uh, where do they occur? Where is the diversity um, found? Well, here's a, a map using um, um, arbitrarily chosen hexagons to show you the number of bumblebee species in each place. And I've got a, a little uh, legend there showing that what the categories goes from zero to five up to 26 to 30. And I want you to see that the diversity is highest in Western coastal and montane situations. And that would include California to some extent. We have among the highest diversity of, of bumblebees on the continent. However, it's important uh, to understand that collections have not been equally done across the continent. So this map is the same data set showing you how many bees have ever been collected in each of these polygons. And um, so the red means not much field work at all. The green means lots of field work. And so you can see that some of the places with high uh, estimated diversity have really high collections. And so we should find more bees there. So it's a, there's a little bit of a, a bias here between uh, the map of diversity and the map of collection effort. And I'll say that this map of collection effort is important because it shows that there are lots of places where we haven't been looking for bees. And that includes some places in California. And, um, and this uh, bumblebee atlas is designed to fill some of those gaps. So uh, the biology of these animals, the ecology, uh, they are social. So they live in a, in a colony group um, and uh, it's different from honeybees and their social life in that it is annual. So the colony just lasts from across the summertime. It starts maybe in spring and ends in fall, let's say. And we'll hear more about that, the timing in a minute. Uh, uh, so honeybee hives can go on for years and years with the same queen. Uh, but bumblebees, everything wraps up in the fall. And um, as you'll hear in a minute, most of the bees will die and just the new queens will survive. Um, social, social behavior is regulated by the queen, who is the big bee in the center top photo uh, amongst her daughters and sons. Uh, most of the other bees in the nest are going to be workers who are uh, daughters who normally do not reproduce. And also there will be some males. And you can see all three of those casts in this center photo. Um, communication is mediated by behavioral stuff, as well as importantly, 
pheromones. Um, there's a division of labor, which is common in social insects. And so some bees do one thing and some bees do another thing. Uh, and everybody benefits by um, this system, by uh, something we call inclusive fitness, which means that um, even the bees that don't breed benefit from helping their mother because they are so closely related to her that when she reproduces, some of their genome, their genes are being passed on to um, to their uh, to their siblings. So um, another interesting thing about social behavior in bumblebees is that we have parental care of offspring. The queen is taking care of the babies, the larva in the beginning, and later sibling care of offspring. This is pretty rare in the insect world uh, outside of sociality. Um, the nests are quite small relative to the honeybee hives that may have 50,000 bees. Um, nests are often 25 to maybe 200 individuals, as much as a, as many as a thousand individuals in the very largest colonies, but that's really unusual. And note that some are social parasites. More on this in a minute. Um, as I said earlier, the food is nectar and pollen, and that's about it. Um, they are dietary generalists, so they can eat many different types of pollen and nectar. So they have some flexibility ecologically. So if they lose a plant to, due to human development activities or something like that, they may still be just fine. And that's different from some bees that need one plant. Um, they, there's an awful lot of learning that goes on as the bee goes through her rather short life cycle, lifespan to, um, to learn to forage. And they uh, have a good memory and they remember what they've done and they actually you know, build knowledge personally as they go through their short lives. Um, and become better foragers as they age. Now, nests are usually found below ground, and the, the photo here shows what a nest look like looks like, and on the right, you see what um, larva looks like inside of a waxen clump that the bees make. Um, they're usually underground. They can also be above ground. Um, historically, that would have been in tree, uh, holes in trees, perhaps, but one species in California, uh, when it nests above ground, it's almost always in a birdhouse. So uh, look for some human, some anthropogenic uh, architecture uh, for some bumblebees. Let's talk about that annual life cycle. So uh, this is a picture of uh, a nice illustration for the rusty patch bumblebee, which does not occur in California. And it is from a temperate area, but we'll use this picture because it works pretty well for California. And so in springtime, um, the queen emerges from hibernation. The queen has mated the previous uh, fall or late summer when she emerged as a new uh, new uh, bee. She found a mate and mated. She stored sperm and then she hibernated. So in early spring, she comes out of the ground, which is where she hibernates uh, in, a, in a short burrow that she digs. She then flies around looking for resources, for food, for herself. Uh, and she also looks for a suitable uh, a hole uh, or a nesting site above or below ground, depending on her preference. Um, and when she finds it, she starts bringing resources, bringing food back to that nest site. And that food, again, is nectar and pollen. She makes a ball of it, and then she lays some eggs right on top of the ball, and she, um, she, she incubates it, just like a bird would. They, in fact, have a, a hairless area on the underside of the abdomen that transmits heat uh, to, the, to the offspring, just like birds do. Um, after about a month, the first offspring come to adulthood, and those are called workers. Again, those are females that generally will never reproduce themselves. Um, and they will now take over all of the colony duties. So that queen was acting like a solitary insect until her first daughters came out. And now she stays home and eats and lays eggs for the most part and is cared for by her daughters. And so the colony successively grows until sometime in summer when uh, they switch over from making these workers to making reproductive offspring. That will be new queens, which we sometimes call gines, you'll hear that word, and males. Males, um, in most cases, all they do is leave the nest, feed themselves and find mates. And those new queens will leave the nest, uh, eat a lot and find mates. And then, as I said, eventually they will hibernate and go through the winter and the cycle starts again. OK, um, this is a sort of idealized uh, scenario. In fact, each year is a little different. And I want to show you data for one species, which is Crotchus bumblebee, from two years of the study so far. This is the relative frequency of this bee in our survey data in two different years. And so you can see that in 2022, we had a, a hump of observations around May 1st, which would be the queens just getting ready, starting to fly around. And then we had a second hump in around July 1st, July 4th, maybe. Um, in 2023, it was much different. The, the bees were later to emerge. 
And then uh, there, there was a much higher peak of abundance later in summer, and that was particularly of males. Um, and this is maybe due to uh, the wet winter we had in 2022-2023, as well as some rain we got during the summer last year. That's my speculation. But I just want you to see that when we actually pull out data, we see that the patterns become a little bit more complicated and variable from year to year. There's one more thing I want to tell you about the nesting biology. And I'm sorry if the title there is cut off a little bit. Um, I switched computers uh, this afternoon and, and um, one computer didn't talk to the other. Uh, so there, as I said earlier, there are some social uh, bumble, uh, sorry, some social parasitic bumblebees. Uh, and these are bumblebees that are not social themselves. Uh, they are true bumblebees, the genus Bombus. They're closely related to the ones that they attack. But what happens is the mated female who has hibernated, um, she's, I'm not going to call her a queen because that's a, a social insect thing. The mated female will come out of hibernation and search around until she finds an existing nest. She'll then go into the nest and attack the bees that are resident. Um, so she'll sometimes kill them, some of them. Um, she'll usually just use pheromones to kind of oppress them and keep them uh, docile. She forces them to work. Uh, and she eats all of the existing eggs and larva and pupa, and then she lays her own eggs. So what happens is the colony stops making its own workers and, and eventually its own reproductives, and it just cranks out reproductives of the cuckoo bumblebee. Um, you will hear people call these sitherous, sitherous with a P. It's a technical term, and um, I'll try not to use it. Um, I'll call them cuckoo bumblebees. Uh, there it is, aka sitherous. So, um, I didn't tell you all that much about the ecology because of time limitations, but I do want you to know that that what we do know is just a fraction of what there is to know about these animals. Um, there are many unanswered questions. We see about a quarter of all bumblebees in decline. That's a huge fraction. For many of them, we're not really sure why. So that's an uncertainty. Um, we, For many of them, we're not sure about specific habitat requirements. We know very little about dispersal from the natal colony. Do they just plunk down right next to the natal colony and hibernate? Yes, in some cases. Um, do they fly really far away? Yes, in some cases, but generally we really don't know. Um, what goes on in the nest is an emerging uh, set of secrets that's really fascinating. We continue to learn uh, things about what goes on in the nest. I'll give you one quick example, and that is it's recently come to light that male bumblebees will sometimes incubate eggs, or sorry, um, larva in the nest. This is not something that we believed that male bumblebees did, um, but we've just uh, started to understand that that is maybe not such an uncommon thing to happen. Um, there's lots about courtship and reproduction we don't know about. And then I'll just highlight male bumblebees. Uh, we generally focus on the females because they are the majority of the bees and they are driving the sociality of the whole thing. And they're really where the interest is. Um, but male bumblebees, um, there's a whole series of questions we, we have, know nothing about. Um, how do pesticides affect sperm competence? Um, how does size affect their ability to find mates? Um, how do pheromones play a role in their mates, mate seeking and selection, et cetera? So lots to learn about bumblebees still. Um, I want to close this introduction by um, kind of questioning why would we bother to do a bumblebee atlas? And I'm sure you've started to get a sense of the reasons why, because you're in the room. Um, the main reason is pollinators are declining. And in particular, bumblebees, about a quarter, as I said, are at some risk of extinction. That's true in California, in the broader North America, and really around the world where we've looked, where we have enough data. It's about a quarter of the species that seem like they're in steep decline. Um, the leading threats are habitat loss, pesticide exposure, diseases and pathogens, and climate change. Um, there are uh, interacting effects between these different effects. So sometimes if you put two of them together, it's worse than the sum of their parts. So for example, uh, if a bee is diseased and it gets exposed to pesticides, that uh, could be much worse for it than either of the two things combined, if you see what I mean. Uh, so to answer some of the questions about declines, we need data. And in fact, we, we have a lot of historic data, but it's not uh, high quality data for our purposes. We are lacking a good baseline for California's bumblebees. Where do they occur? How common are they? Um, how do they do in a dry year? How do they do in a wet year? Um, who's declining and who's coming back, et cetera. And so this, this uh, survey that you're participating in, this atlas, is going to answer some of those questions. And in fact, already has. And the photo here is one of our mentors, uh, Rich and myself. This is Robin Thorpe. He was a professor at UC Davis and did a lot of the foundational bumblebee work in California. And so we'd like to say thank you to him. Um, he has passed, but uh, he's an important part of 
the background of why we even do bumblebee atlases here. Um, another reason we do a bumblebee atlas is that it works. So we're not just playing around here. This is not just fun stuff for amateur naturalists, as you know, you'll sometimes hear a scientist say disparaging things about community science along those lines. You're doing real science if you join this. Um, the data that you collect is the single best data that exists for determining if bees are coming or going, if you will. Um, and this example here shows that uh, the Pacific Northwest bumblebee atlas identified many new places where the Western bumblebee, a declining species, occurs in Oregon and Washington. And um, without this atlas with trained um, amateurs or, or naturalists such as yourselves, um, we wouldn't know these things. Scientists don't have the person power to get out there and collect all of this data. So understand that community science works and um, the Bumblebee Atlas model has been really successful. So this is a reason to keep doing this. And so um, this is a one slide plug for our project and you don't need to read everything about it, but there is our website in bold. I will be referring repeatedly to the website as I talk um, in the other modules. And if you miss the specific page I'm talking about, just go to the website and you can find it. So it's cabumblebeeatlas.org. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and see if we can take a few questions. Um, we are not, we don't have a lot of time, but um, let's see here. Um, okay. Uh, so somebody says, so the big bumblebees we're seeing out right now are probably still queens. The little ones that come out later are the daughters. That's right. Um, so the early season bees are quite large. Those are those queens. And um, later in season, if you see smaller bees, they're generally going to be workers or later males. And so there is a lot of size differentiation between the casts or the different types of roles. However, um, there's a lot of variation also within, within each group. Um, so, uh, so yes, uh, another person asked if you could assume early season bees are queens. Generally, yes, especially if they are large bodies, bodied. Um, one more question now. If bumblebees hibernate through the winter, why was I observing yellow-faced bumblebees foraging on manzanita flowers in December 2023 and January of this year in Monterey County, California? Great question, Catherine. Um, in fact, uh, the season, uh, the spring, quote unquote spring for bumblebees can start in December in California. This is not the case in very many places in North America. Um, the Gulf Coast and areas of, of Florida are like this, but um, put simply, some of the bumblebee queens just don't hibernate or they hibernate for two weeks and then they come up and then they go back to hibernation when it gets cold. And so on the coast, we will see bumblebees on and off rarely right on the beaches, right through the year. Um, but in December, some of them actually get going and start founding their colonies. And so great places to see winter bumblebees are manzanita and madrone um, and other early season flowers or, or late season flowers, perhaps um, that you might have in your garden. Um, so when I say spring, it depends on what climate in California you live in, I guess. So um, we're gonna have to hold it there and I'll move right on to the next, uh, the next module, which as I said earlier, is um, is a longer module. Oops, one second. Okay. Uh, module two. And, oops, sorry, that's module one, hold on. Okay. All right, here we are, module two, uh, part participating in the atlas. This is the methods. This is the 80 minutes in which I will tell you how to do, how to participate in the project, how to collect bees, collect data, um, do surveys, how to uh, submit data to the project. So let's get into it. Um, again, it's 80 minutes and um, I'm sorry that this is a little lopsided and you have to wait um, 100 minutes before getting a bathroom break or a break, um, but uh, that's how it is. And we will do that five minute break at the end of this. So the California Bumblebee Atlas is just one of many. As I said earlier, there are 20 states in which we are doing this Bumblebee Atlas uh, project. 
um, this year. We were in 15 states last year, so the project is growing quickly. Uh, we've added some um, some mountain states, Montana, Wyoming, um, Utah, and Nevada this year. And so the project is growing really quickly, and California is, is in its third year as a bumblebee atlas. But what this means is you're going to hear across the season, you, you might get some emails or um, see stuff on our socials about the Bumblebee Atlas project writ large. Um, and sometimes we'll have some friendly competitions among the different projects. Um, so you'll hear a little bit about the other projects, even though you are a Californian. Uh, so what, what have we learned so far in this project? What are you going to be contributing to a third year of? Well, um, we started in 2022. And so far in those first two years, we have more than 650 people who have gone through this training, taken a quiz, and gotten um, named on our scientific collecting permit with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So, um, so that's 650 people who can collect data for the project. Uh, those folks have netted more than 10,000 observations of bumblebees, pardon the pun, and um, we've done this in more than 1,100 individual point surveys. You'll hear about point surveys quite a bit in just a minute. Um, we have a grid that we put across the state, and we ask people to adopt grid cells as places in which to survey. We've um, completed about 70 of 265 cells. So we're doing very well at sort of the metrics of, of participation, data qu quantity, and the, dis the spread of the data. However, there's much more work to do. Um, if you're interested, uh, we have some nice data summaries on the website, and this graph in the middle is an example of just one of those. Uh, so please go to um, our project highlights page, and you can see some of that material. Uh, and oops, eh, there's a little map that's not showing. I wanted to say also um, a big focus for 2024 is surveys on BLM lands, the Bureau of Land Manage Management, which owns a large amount of land in the state of California. You will be hearing from me via newsletter emails in the near future about how to engage with those lands, what the process is for um, uh, getting permission to go and do surveys on one of those parcels. So more about that uh, soon. So uh, I wanted to also, before getting into the methods, to just um, give us all a pat on the back. Um, uh, in early February, I went to the Wildlife Society's Western Section meeting and presented about our project. Um, and surprise, I was surprised to, um, with my colleagues, Dylan Winkler um, and Hilary Sardinius to be given this award uh, for, the, for the project. It's called Conservationist of the Year. It is definitely not for any of us individuals. It is for the project in general. And so those of you who have, who have been um, contributing, this is a, an award that where the other potential projects that could have been awarded this came from um, four or five different Western states. And I see it as something of a big deal that we've made a mark enough on the professional wildlife biologist community that there's, they see the conservation work we're doing and, and think it's of value. So um, so thank you very much for your contributions to, um, to the project. Um, also, we've got some somewhat good news about some grants that we've been applying for, and we think we are going to be able to be able to extend the project for three more years after this one. So if you like what you see, um, there will likely be more in the near future. All right, how do we participate? So step number one uh, is to adopt a grid cell. So those are those cells that I mentioned, and here's the map of them. They are uh, approximately 50 kilometers on a side. Uh, so that's a very large area. We don't expect you to thoroughly survey that area. We actually just want you to do two surveys over the course of the summer somewhere in that cell. You can adopt multiple cells if you want. It's okay if two different people have the same cell, whether or not they're aware of each other working in that area, um, the more the merrier. Uh, if you're a returning volunteer and you previously adopted grid cells, you don't have to adopt them again. If you wanna go somewhere new, please do adopt them so we know that. Um, but again, don't, don't bother re-adopting your cell if you're coming back for a, a second or third year. Um, so after you have that cell, um, you're gonna figure out where you will do your surveys. And then you'll follow these standardized protocols that I'm going to teach you in this hour. So we'll do two surveys. Um, in those surveys, you will collect data about bees by actually catching bees and handling them. And you'll collect data about the habitats. And then later, you will upload your data to Bumblebee Watch, which is the website we use to manage the data. Ah, um, here is the, the BLM map that I was referring to earlier. I thought it was on that previous slide. Um, so, uh, so, um, 
I've already said this to you, but this is a map of the BLM lands. And um, I will be telling you more about how to do surveys at these places. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than working on the US Forest Service lands or a state park, but it is, um, well, I'm here to help and facilitate with this process and it shouldn't be much trouble at all. So stay tuned for an email that explains some details about this. Um, I often gloss right over the material on this slide and I've come to realize that for someone who's new to insects or bees or stinging insects, um, this stuff, it really matters. These are like questions front of mind. So um, how do I use that net? Well, uh, the best way to find this out is to, to join us at a, at a field event, and we'll be announcing the roster of field events very soon, in fact, this week, um, um, and it will grow over the course of the season. Um, but anyway, uh, the way you swing the net is uh, generally directly at the bee on the flower, as if you're trying to get the bee right in the center of the net. Uh, you can swing horizontally, as Rich is doing in this photo, or you can come down over the top, as uh, one of our volunteers is doing. Um, there are various ways to do that. Once you get the bee in the net, um, you're going to uh, you're going to encourage the bee to climb up to the very top of the net, which um, which will facilitate getting the bee into a vial. Um, basically, the bees are going to want to climb up, and so once it's inside the net material, you just hold the top of the net up high, and even if the bottom of the net is wide open, the bees will usually fly and walk to the top. You're gonna you're gonna squeeze off the the little bit of net that the bee is inside of, and make sure you have some net to protect your fingers from stings. And then you're gonna take a vial, put it into the into the net, and work that bee into the vial. And then you're gonna take the top of the vial and go back in and put it on top. Um, it's awkward at first, and it will feel dangerous at first. It's not particularly dangerous once you learn how to do this. It's really I can probably do it with my eyes closed. Um, I have a lot of experience, but I want you to understand that once you get the knack of it, it is really easy and um, safe. Stings do occur. Uh, I maybe get stung twice a year and I handle hundreds to thousands of bees. Um, so once you know what you're doing, it's rare. Uh, these bees, uh, the females can sting, the males cannot sting. Um, and um, so you just need to be aware of where your fingers are relative to the bees and get familiar with their behavior. So for example, I told you that when the net is held vertically, they will fly or, or walk to the top. And that's just a behavior you can exploit to safely get them where you want them. Um, so, um, so you'll learn some of this, but um, stings are a remote possibility. And for most of us, it's just a, a transient unpleasantness. Um, some people are allergic. And if you know you're allergic, you definitely need to have uh, an EpiPen with you when you do this work and make sure to take care of your own medical needs with respect to that. I personally sometimes react and I do carry an EpiPen. Um, you probably are fine if, you, if you've if um, you never had a reaction to bee stings, but that, that's sort of up to you on that side um, to be very careful about this um, if you think you could, you could um, be allergic. Um, so those field events that I mentioned previously are the best way to learn all of this stuff. And they're going to be um, announced on our events page, uh, I believe, starting tomorrow. So um, check back soon and um, you'll find that we are, I am coming to your neck of the woods um, at some point this summer. And I'll be doing a usually Saturday event where um, you can come take a walk with me and learn to catch bees. Um, the the uh, methods here are um, are no kill, as you probably know. We're not actually killing bees in kill jars. We're putting them in a vial, and the vial goes in a cooler. Um, so you are going to need to come up with a cooler that is practical for the field. Um, it's generally not too big and heavy. Um, you uh, want ice that is just below freezing or at freezing. You do not want ice or ice packs that are down near zero Fahrenheit. Um, you know, some some people's home refrigerators can chill uh, to near zero Fahrenheit, and that ice, resulting ice or cold packs, can kill the bees. But we want the ice to be around freezing, but not too much colder. Um, the bees are just fine on that at the, that temperature, but they do hit hit a, a critical zone if we go much lower, and you'll start to see dead bees, and we don't want that. Um, I almost always use store-bought ice. I just stop at the grocery store on my way to the field and get a bag of ice. And that stuff, the, the, the crushed ice is perfect for our needs. Um, okay, so when should you go looking for bees? Well, as you probably know, the project has three launch dates. The first was March 15th. 
Um, and that's for Southern California, generally speaking. Uh, the second is April 15th, and that is for Central California, the Coast Ranges, and the Central Valley, generally speaking. And May 15th is the date for Northern California and the mountains. And you'll have to refer to the map that I showed of the grid cells, which is on the website, just to see which um, which opening date your per particular grid cell has. And we stagger them this way because we want to keep um, from catching and handling queens as much as we can. We don't want you to avoid catching queens. If you see one and it's the bee to catch, you catch that bee. Uh, but we just don't want to put you out there on the first day that the queens are active because it's a sensitive time of life and we're, we just don't want to disturb them. It could um, cause colony failure, maybe. Um, and uh, just so you know, in dry years, um, bumblebee activity does end a lot sooner than um, in other years. So 2022, bees became scarce in midsummer, except in wetter, high elevation places. Last year, they were abundant straight into September. So um, think about local conditions when you're thinking about the timing of your work. Where should we look for bees? Um, we uh, we have a lot of options here. Uh, you should check your own backyard if you're interested in so doing. Um, any private lands where you have access. Uh, roadsides, which are usually in the public domain and um, can be unsafe, but also are places where anybody can, can swing a net. Um, and then public lands. Um, we have or will soon have permits for the bolded uh, jurisdictions there, national parks, national monuments, California State Parks, U.S. Forest Service lands, and BLM. Uh, the others that I mentioned there are a subset of public lands or conserved lands. Those we will not have permits for, but if you want to work at, say, your county park or your local city park um, or a national wildlife refuge, it's your responsibility to make that contact and find out what you need to do to get permission to do the survey. So you would introduce yourself as a, as a volunteer for this project, explain what you want to do, and that you're permitted and um, and ask for permission. Uh, if you need any assistance, bring me into it. Um, you can copy me by email and I can help with that sort of stuff. Uh, the bottom line is you must have permission to enter the lands that you survey. Um, again, uh, where to look for bees? Well, what kind of habitats? Um, bees are somewhat generalized in what they eat, as I said uh, earlier, and they live in a wide array of different types of habitats. Um, the data here is from the first two years of the survey, and it's showing the uh, these are these are box, plot, box plots, and the the bold black line in the middle of each one is the the uh, the median number of bees caught in that habitat, um, and so and the the red dashed line is the average across all of them. So on average, we caught about seven bees per survey, but we got the most bees in places like wetlands and grasslands and forests. Uh, agricultural lands produce the fewest bees and developed and roadside areas produced also quite few bees. So um, habitat quality varies quite a bit, but we think that you should consider any and all of these types of locations, um, including locations dominated by, by invasive plants like yellow star thistle uh, depicted here, inc including places where you just don't, you're not really sure bees would use it. Um, it looks grassy and not a lot of flowers. Um, be creative and open-minded about where you look for bees. Um, and you're going to start to find them in places that, um, that surprise you a bit. Um, basically, anywhere where there are abundant flowers that are attractive to bees um, will be a good place to at least ask the question, are, are there bumblebees here? Do a survey there. Um, so how, how are we looking? Well, as I said, we're not killing bumblebees uh, to vouch for their, their occurrence. We will be chilling them, and we will be um, identifying them in the field and photographing them. And um, so basically the most important thing for you to do is just find those bees, follow the protocol, get good photos of those bees and submit them to, to Bumblebee Watch. So we'll go through all of that in detail. All right, so a little bit more detail about, about how to actually do the survey work, how to look for the bees. Well, um, again, we're gonna look for a good piece of habitat. We don't want you to necessarily just choose a random spot um, somewhere in the state, although that's fine if you want to, um, but identify an area where you think you have some chance of finding bees. Maybe it's a uh, it's a natural area like this one that has a ton of lupin. That sounds good to me. Um, uh, you're going to establish a service area, sur survey area. You're going to choose these areas. So this is within your grid cell, but you will choose the specific point localities. 
Um, we want to survey about uh, one hectare of land, which is about two and a half football fields, um, or for roadside surveys, which I'll describe later, a large patch of flowers will suffice. Uh, for the point survey, which is the main survey instrument we're teaching you tonight, um, we want a timed 45 minute survey effort. Um, you're going to look for bumblebees on every, all the flowers that occur in your one hectare plot. I should have said earlier, you do not have to measure with tapes to get a one hectare plat. You can um, eyeball it. So two and a half football fields, if you know what that looks like, um, just do your best to get the right area. Um, you can measure it online if you know how to do that. Um, um, you can use various methods, but we're not asking you to actually get it right down to the, the, uh, the square meter. Um, so you're gonna look at bees on all the flowers. Um, any bee you see, that's the bumblebee that you try to catch. So it's sort of random. You want to randomly look around at flowering plants until you see a bumblebee, and then you stop looking at all other bumblebees, all other flowers, and you just try to catch that bee. So that's the random part. If you miss it, that's fine. Just move on and start do the thing again. Look for bees. The first one you see, try to catch it. Um, so you'll net that bee and you'll place it in a vial in your cooler. Um, at the end of the survey, you're going to be documenting those bees. And we'll talk about how to do that. You're then going to co collect um, um, some brief habitat data about the site, about what plants are flowering, what the structure of vegetation is like, what disturbances you may see there. Um, and we're going to ask you to take good photos and fill out the data sheets completely. What do you need to do these surveys? Um, here's a, a list of the more important things, um, ranked somewhat by importance. You need a net and a cooler and vials and a camera. Um, your phone is good enough as a camera. I, as long as you have a modern smartphone, um, your smartphone can take high quality macro images that will be suitable for identification. It's another thing to be really good at using that camera. And we'll talk a bit about how to do so in a minute. Um, if you have a better camera, feel free to use that. We are not asking you to spend money on a fancy camera, but if you already own one or whatever the case may be, um, it's great if you'll take even better photos than what I can get with my my smartphone. But understand that the, the phone is a, can be an excellent camera for this purpose. Um, we have data sheets that are on the website and downloadable. Um, they're also in the manual, which is on the website and downloadable. Um, so you'll print those and take a paper copy in the field. We're not using a digital um, um, survey one, two, three, or other sort of data collection method. Um, you're going to be timing yourself for 45 minutes. You're also going to be stopping the watch when you stop um, searching for bees. So if you catch one, you're going to hit your phone or your watch and stop the timer and process the bee into the vial, into the cooler, and then start the timer again. So it's a net 45 minutes, but actually it takes maybe an hour, hour and 10 minutes, depending on how many bees you see. Um, there are various maps, um, field guides that you may be interested in, uh, field notebook if that's if that's something you like to do. Um, a GPS unit can be handy. Uh, and then personal items, um, please think about your own safety before you think about collecting data. Um, and that would mean plenty of drinking water, food, sunscreen, hat, um, and uh, bringing back the idea of the EpiPen again. If you are a person who would feel safer or be safer with one of those in your pocket, please get a prescription and get one. Okay, so the formal surveys. There are two types of formal surveys. Um, the first is the point survey. And as I said, that's like the primary survey instrument, the main way that we collect data for this project. And it's the most valuable type of data that you can submit to the project. We also do roadside surveys. Um, so that point survey is that one hectare. It's the 45 minutes and um, it includes a thorough habitat assessment. The roadside survey is done along a stretch of road and you'll stop repeatedly and do a much shorter uh, collecting effort, about 15 minutes, and you'll do a shorter habitat assessment and you'll repeat that five times. So um, different types of surveys. Um, there's the two and a half football fields analogy. So um, um, if you're not going to measure your one hectare, um, think about that. Uh, you could also look up what's the radius of a circle of one hectare. I don't know it offhand, but um, just go into the field with an idea of what the size of this of this thing should be. And then um, don't worry about it after that. There is a third way to submit data or collect data, and that is the incidental survey. So incidentals are when you photograph a bee doing something somewhere at some time. Um, you don't need a permit to do this, of course. Anyone can snap a shot of a bee. Um, these are just haphazardly collected observations. Um, some of the most wonderful bumblebee observations I've made are um, 
crossing a parking lot to a grocery store or the photo I showed you of the honeybee and the bumblebee together. I was holding one of my children in one hand and snapping photos of the bees. You know, I had better things to be doing than um, getting bee photos. But the point here is that um, bees occur when they occur. And um, if you want to take photos of them, we would love for you to uh, upload them. Um, so uh, more on the point survey. So how about planning it? What do we do? Well, again, I'm going to say safety first. Please take care of yourself um, before you take care of bees and data. Uh, then um, we're going to look around the, the maps of, in our grid cell and select a few locations to go. Um, for example, OK, I know that I can go to that state park or my friend has that land, um, et cetera. Right? So get a couple of ideas. Um, be somewhat open minded about you know, the, the fact that you may encounter a gate or some other reason you can't go somewhere. So have a couple of backup ideas. And of course, just make sure someone knows where you're going and when to expect you home. Uh, sorry, there we go. Um, so how are we going to do the actual surveying in a point survey? So again, you're gonna have multiple locations that you could do the work. And then within a location, you may get there and find, um, oh, over on this side of the field, this seems like it's got flowers, this will work. But over there in this meadow, it's not gonna be good. So you kind of have to get there before you know exactly where you'll do your survey. Um, we ask that for every grid cell you adopt, that you do two surveys within that grid cell each summer in 2024. Um, you can adopt multiple grid cells if you want, but we really want two surveys in the same broader cell um, in a season. They can be at the same exact location on two different dates separated by three weeks or more, or they can be in two different locations um, on the same day or different dates, doesn't matter. It's just those two surveys that we, we are interested in. Um, each of those surveys is 45 person minutes long. And I said, you will stop that, uh, that watch for transferring bees into the cooler and um, taking notes and taking a water break and whatever else you may do. Um, I get distracted frequently in the field by non-bumblebee things. And, um, and, and so sometimes I have to stop the watch to go look at a plant or something. Um, so we want a net effort. We, want, we all want to do 45 minutes of effort uh, of, of looking and catching per survey. So that's why we're standardizing in these kinds of ways. Um, it is OK to, for two people to do a survey together, or three people. Um, but understand that we still want 45 net minutes of survey. Um, so uh, so if there are two of you, break it apart and you each do 22 and a half minutes of survey work. OK? All right. Uh, OK, um, there are some pros and some cons to the point survey. So the pros, well, it's again, it's the best data for conservation and management uses. It's the highest value data that this project will produce. Um, it's effort limited, so we know how much effort went into catching those bees. We have real abundance data. So per unit time, how many bees did the person catch is really an important metric that we can get um, from point surveys. Um, they're, they're longer than roadside surveys, so you're gonna encounter more species. Um, you'll get more detailed habitat information. Um, the environment is often not a roadside and it's more a naturalistic place like this amazing restored beach in Eureka, uh, sand dune complex, um, and fewer logistics. You don't have to worry as much about getting hit by a car or, uh, or um, other things about roadside service that I find challenging. Um, there are cons. It's just one little point in a huge grid cell. So what can it say really about the 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer grid cell? That is a shortcoming. Um, and you may uh, miss a species that is in the area just because you chose a site that's just a little too far away from where it happened to nest. And there's no way to know that, but that is something that might happen with, um, with a point survey. Um, let's move on to the roadside surveys. So again, please think about safety before you do other things related to this work. Um, we haven't had, to my knowledge, any any events, um, and we'd really like to, you know, keep everybody safe. So um, similar to point surveys, select uh, your route before you head out. Uh, be aware that the road that you think you want to work on might turn out to not be practical. Uh, when I do these surveys, I generally like to use a dirt road or a less traveled road and or a road with more naturalistic, natural vegetation on the roadsides, right? This particular road at Carrizo Plain is great. It's paved, but it's got lots of good stuff on the on the outskirts, on the edges of the road. Um, a, a really heavily traveled freeway or something is not really an appropriate place to do this work unless you know you're safe and you have permission. Um, again, remain flexible uh, about what you're going to find when you get out there. 
certainly respect property ownership, um, notwithstanding the fact that you are allowed to be on the roadside. Um, and of course, make sure someone knows where you are. So how do we do this? The route is about 10, minute, 10, 10 miles long. Um, here's a nice dirt road of the sort I'm describing as my preference, also at Carrizo Plain. Um, a survey is going to be about 10 miles long and have five stops. Uh, they're separated by more equal to or more than half a mile. And this is just so that we uh, we have very little chance of catching the same bee at two adjacent um, stops or even the bees of the same colony. Um, and so you don't want all the stops right next to each other or you might recount the same bee. Um, you're going to do 15 person minutes of effort, not 45. And so that means same thing. You'll stop the watch when you catch a bee and you need to transfer it or when you want to take a break. But otherwise, you're searching, watching, looking, swinging the net uh, uh, fruitfully or not. Um, and the, the watch is ticking. But stop when you get the bee in the vial so that you it's a net of 15 minutes of survey effort. Um, when you add data to Bumblebee Watch, uh, this is down in the weeds, but um, you, we ask you to name the site that you worked at. And for roadside surveys, there are five sites. And so we just ask that when you name those sites, you use names that connect the five to each other. You can make this up. And my example here is the first one's called West Road number one. The second one is West Road number two. Um, this would just make it easier for us on the data management side when we start to look at trends in the data and put together the road segments. Uh, pros and cons of roadside surveys. Well, a uh, major pro is that you get a larger spatial distribution of surveys across the landscape. Um, 10 miles in a somewhat linear fashion is different from a single point, right? You'll encounter different types of habitats along the way there. And access is usually a snap. Um, again, it's a safety issue, but otherwise, um, you, as long as you can pull over legally and safely, um, you may be able to survey for bees on the side of the road there, right? Um, Cons, uh, we see many more invasive plants on roadsides than out in the wildlands. And um, that's not necessarily, that's not a bad thing, but we just don't want to bias the survey to only the non-native plants. Um, and then these individual surveys only take 15 minutes and therefore you may miss rarer species that it just takes longer before you catch the first one of that, that rare type. Uh, incidental observations, our third and final type of survey method. This again is the one where you're carrying a baby and you see a cool bee, um, or you're on a beach uh, and you see a cool bee, as in this case. Uh, the bee is alive and flying or on a flower and you take some nice photos of it. And if they're good enough, we can identify that bee. Um, you didn't need to handle it. You didn't need a permit. It maybe took you 15 seconds. So these are very casual opportunistic um, observations. Uh, you can do it absolutely anywhere. Um, the photos do have to be high enough quality for us to, um, to identify the bees. And it's a lot more challenging to photograph a live bee than, uh, uh, sorry, a, a flying bee, free flying bee than one that we've chilled in the cooler. Um, it, it, anyway, uh, the photos will be uploaded to Bumblebee Watch and you're not gonna be collecting habitat data in this case. Um, you're not gonna have to tell us whether it was cloudy um, or what plants were growing there. You just very little data about the site name and location, um, the date and time, and then you'll give us the photo and that's about it. So these are really easy. There are instances where I should or want to do a lot of point surveys, but I don't have enough time. Um, and then I will just take a hike and I will do incidentals instead. I'll work like crazy, but um, I'll, I'll identify lots of bees um, here and there and submit these to, to Bumblebee Watch. It's not as high quality data as point surveys, but sometimes it stands in as a really good um, next best way to get data about who lives here. The pros of incidental observations, they're very quick. You can do it anytime, any place. Uh, the permit doesn't matter. Um, um, there's no space constraint or time minimums. Um, photos can give us ecological context, as in this case where a crab spider is um, sucking the life out of a male um, um, bumblebee. And, um, you know, this tells us something about the way they live and die. And that's something we don't get out of uh, point surveys or roadside surveys. Um, on the other side, there's no measure of effort here. So we don't know how long we've had to look for the bee before you finally got a nice photo of the, the spider eating the bee. Um, there's more human bias. You know, I think predation is really cool. So this bee got its photo taken and placed on Bumblebee Watch, and it wouldn't have probably if I'd just seen it zip by, right? 
Um, and also we don't describe the habitat when we submit incidentals. So um, that's just an unknown for the users of the data downstream. So those are the three types of surveys. Uh, I now wanna to turn to talking a little bit about um, say, uh, how to keep the bees safe and how to think about environmental compliance. Um, so um, safe bee handling, we want to sterilize or clean vials and lids between surveys. So um, when you come in from the field, um, as soon as possible, wash your vials. I like to use a 10% bleach solution and then rinse them and then air dry them. You can use ethanol or hydrogen peroxide or failing that hot soapy water with manual scrubbing and uh, drying. So we want to uh, not, the, the main thing here is that we don't want to transfer diseases between bees. And we can absolutely do that with these, with these vials. So this is an important step for bee um, well-being. Uh, we want to limit bees' time in vials at ambient temperatures to less than five minutes. So when you catch a bee, don't stow it in your pocket for 20 minutes. Take it to the cooler and put it in there. Um, at ambient temps, they will very quickly start to wither and sweat. Well, not really sweat, but um, uh, they will lose a lot of moisture and you will see that in the vial and they can die quickly. Um, once, once they're in the cooler, please don't keep them in the cooler for more than two hours or 120 minutes. Um, they're probably fine for, um, for two days in the cooler, but uh, bees will start dying more frequently after two hours and we, we want to avoid that. Um, the third thing about this is uh, we want to release those bees somewhat close to where we actually caught them. So we say within 100 meters of the collection locality, which should cover you in your one hectare. So if you're sitting down in the shade at the edge of the one hectare to do your data processing, you can release all the bees right there, even though you caught them over on the other side of the field or whatever. Um, just in the general vicinity, we want to put them back where we got them. Um, photography is a very, very important part of this. In fact, I like to say it's the most important thing you can do in this project. Um, that's because there's no specimen. You're not collecting a dead bee and sending it to us. Um, it's your photos that are the specimen, that are the voucher of collection. So we need good photos. Um, in general, uh, each photo, I like to say that if you can see individual hairs in focus somewhere in the photo, that is probably a good photo. So here's a really nice photo I took with my cell phone um, where you can see a lot, I'm saying it's really nice, you may disagree, <laughs> um, but technically speaking, it's doing what I want it to do. You can see hairs, you can distinguish black hairs from yellow hairs, which will turn out to be an important thing for many species. Um, I can get a sense of the color on one segment as opposed to the color on, a, on another segment. Um, so that's just a little, it's, easier to talk about than to do, but if you get photos where individual hairs come into focus, you're on the right track. Um, we are going to want photos, uh, you can only submit five and really four, as you'll hear in a minute. Um, we want photos that show the hind leg, um, which is where they carry that pollen, um, and that will help us distinguish males and females and um, cuckoos from the others. We wanna see that head. We wanna see the color of the hair on the top of the head and on the face, which is, uh, the area between the big eyes, the compound eyes, and where the antenna originate between uh, the big eyes, the compound eyes, that's the face. We want to see the hair color there and on the on the top of the head, which is sometimes called the vertex. We also really importantly want to see the cheek, which I'm going to explain on the next slide. Uh, the thorax, which is the second and middle part of the body, we want to see hair color. Uh, we want to see the hair color across the top, uh, in front of the wings, uh, next to the wings and behind the wings, as well as hair color under the wing bases on the side, which you can see in this image. And then for some bees, uh, we're going to want to see what the underside of the abdomen looks like. Uh, sorry, and for all bees, we want to see the abdomen, as in this shot. We, we can't see every segment, but uh, maybe this one shows us the first four segments, and then the next photo might show us the, the final three or four segments overlapping. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. Uh, let's get into a little bit more detail about photography. And here is a little cartoon uh, graphic that shows you some of the, of the verbiage I'll use here. So we have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, those three body parts that insects have. And the abdomen is composed of turga. Singular is turgum. I won't make you say that word or remember it, but we, we, uh, we abbreviate that as T. And there are, on females, six of these segments and on males, seven. And we call them T1, T2, T3. So you'll hear us say things like T3 is red and T4 is yellow. And that's, that's this shorthand we're using. 
Um, so uh, on the head, here's a photo of the head, and this is a pretty good photo. You can see the vertex or the top of the head where the, the simple eyes are, those funny little spider-like eyes that sit right on the top of the head. Um, the hair around those is what we're interested in. You can see it's black on this bee. Then on the face, you can see black hair as well. And I can see the cheek, which I'm going to explain again in a minute. Um, it's just below the compound eye. Um, so these are things on the head we want to see. On that thorax, again, we're going to want to see the hair color before, at, and behind the wings, and then below the wing bases, as you can see pretty well in this photo. Um, the character of the, there's often a black spot or, or stripe across the top there. Is it a spot? Is it an oval? Is it a rectangle? These are all things that you want to note in your photos if you can. And then again, the abdomen. Um, what is the color of the hair on each of the six or seven abdominal turgites or turga? Um, uh, so, um, so just the photo should be able to show us um, what the hair color is on each of those segments. And you'll often be able to see the overlapping segments as you go down the body. As in this photo, you can kind of make out the different segments by where the hair is originating. Um, so um, you will look at the quality of the hair, the color of the hair. You look at whether the hair's the different colors on the leading edge of the segment than it is in, at the back side of the segment. Um, all of these things may be important for different bees. After you photograph your anesthetized chilled bee that has is fresh from the cooler, take a look at your photos. Um, look and see if you got good enough photos. And of these four, I would say the one on the left is the only one that's good uh, and, and adequate. The others are not necessarily uh, worthless. Like uh, the, the third one, we can figure out what bee that is from the photo. But in general, it, try to get better photos than this. And if you find that you haven't yet, then take some more. Uh, it's absolutely fine if, if your finger or pens or anything else are in the background or the, the sides of the photo. Um, these are photos for technical purposes, right? They don't have to be composed nicely unless you feel like it. <laughs> um, so don't worry about, um, about handling the bees and manipulating things just a little bit to get that shot. In this picture, the person is spreading the wings with their finger just a little bit so that you can see down to the second abdominal segment, which is brownish color. So this is the kind of decision making I'm talking about when you're taking photos. We want to see that second segment there and the, the wings, we're covering it up. So this person is, is um, just moving the wing of the anesthetized bee so that they can take that picture. All right, so a summary on all of this. Uh, so for incidental observations, you're going to need patience and you're going to have to learn to take photos of uh, bees moving quickly. It's really fun, in my view. It can be frustrating. Um, it's a sit and wait kind of thing. Um, you learn a lot about the bees chasing them around, trying to photograph them. Um, for point and roadside surveys, we're going to capture the bee with a net. We're going to get it into the vial and then the cooler. Um, 20 minutes later or so, the bee will be anesthetized and we will take it out of the cooler, photograph it and release it. Um, and those bees can stay in the cooler for two hours, 120 minutes. Um, make sure you're taking detailed photos and that you're releasing the bees on site. Okay, uh, I, we're going to go through now um, data sheets. Um, I did say earlier we're going to talk about environmental compliance, and we are, but uh, not quite yet. Just one second. Okay, this is an image of the data sheet, um, which you're going to print out and, and carry with you. And uh, I'm going to go through what it looks like somewhat briefly, and then we'll talk about data upload to Bumblebee Watch. So on the first of two pages, um, you have some basic site information. We want to know a site name, which you devise, uh, what your grid cell is, what date you did this, whether you're doing a roadside or a point survey. Um, you see that we want temperature, wind speed, cloud cover, uh, importantly, we want to know who were the observers and how many of you were there. Uh, we want to know the start time and the end time, and then the net number of minutes. The net number of minutes, if possible, should be 45. And remember that, that you will typically spend more than 45 minutes in your survey. So it might take you an hour uh, of gross time in order to get 45 net minutes of survey time. So we do want to know the start time and the end time, even though they don't need to be 45 minutes apart. Um, the primary survey method, almost all of us, the answer is the first one, captured all observed bumblebees. For experts, we are, are fine if you cap capture one of each species and then start just counting them. It's really dicey. Uh, everyone makes mistakes with ID. 
um, including the so-called experts. And so I would um, encourage you to catch every bumblebee you see and don't think that you're seeing the same species over and over. It takes a long time to, to realize some of the nuances between some of the harder ones. Um, uh, and we have a space on the data sheet for recording bumblebee observations here. Um, uh, and I'm gonna talk about that more in just a second. Um, when you do a survey, you may not find any bumblebees. We call this a no, uh, a, a null survey. Sometimes I call it a zero B survey. Um, that is not wasted time. That is not bad data. That is really important information. It tells us where the bees do not occur, right? And in a place like California, um, with a changing world and, uh, and in, uh, increasing frequency of droughts, we really want to know where it's too dry or too hot or too something for bumblebees. So if you do a survey and you don't get bees, um, we do want to know about that. So we want you to submit the data. And there's this little image at the bottom of the page that says, this is a null survey. That is from Bumblebee Watch. And I'll show it to you again in a minute. We just want you to click that box. If you didn't get bees, we want to we want all the other data, but we want you to click the box that says, there are no bees in this survey. And then we'll know how to handle that, that um, survey. Um, uh, so, sorry. So this is, uh, the image I just showed you is um, an outdated version of the, um, the form. This is what the first page of the form looks like. Again, we're gonna um, get the basic site information, um, the weather information, and then uh, we ask you for habitat information. We wanna know what type of habitat you were surveying in. Was it a grassland? Was it a woodland? Was it uh, ag lands? And it's up to you to, um, to do your best to classify the habitat type. And you can see we have some examples there. Um, we are not going to teach the sort of ecology of California natural communities to everybody. And I wish we had time to do so because then we get higher quality data about habitats, but do your best. And these are generalized categories. And so most of us would pick the same category without training, I think. Um, so we wanna know the, the habitat you were in, but then on the right there, if there was a secondary habitat uh, or, or tertiary, we wanna know what that was also. So you can give us other habitat types that are in the, the vicinity. Um, so going down that same page, you can see that we next want to know um, what percent of the area had flowering resources available. So percent cover of flowers. Um, that's an estimate that you'll make. Then we want to know about nesting habitat. Did you see any of the following things? Bunch grasses, rodent holes, brush piles, and so on. These are all um, um, habitat types that bumblebees may choose um, when they're choosing nest sites. Uh, then there's management stuff. We want to know about disturbance and management kinds of things. And the answers are yes, no, or suspect. So was there mowing evident? Yes, no, or I suspect there was. Um, grazing by native animals and non-native animals, agriculture, insecticide use. Um, fire is an important one. Do you see any evidence of fire? So burned wood, burned scars, you know, the various things that we see. Um, with fire. Uh, we, we ask if you see honeybee hives, and this is almost always the answer is no, but if you see them, please count them and put a number there. And then there's a place for notes, and um, you can tell us whatever you want there that you think is important. Um, personally, I really like it when people tell us the relative number of honeybees they saw. I'm not going to tell you any method for doing this or that you have to do this, but if you didn't see any honeybees, it's actually interesting uh, because in most surveys we see honeybees. So that's just a little a little uh, suggestion. Um, moving to the second page, uh, this is where we are going to add the plants that we see and the bees. And I'm sorry, uh, a minute ago, I showed you a form that had the bees on the first page. Um, they're actually on the second page. So first of all, we're gonna record how many different uh, species of plants were in flower in the area. So it's categories one to two, three to five, six to 10. And you can see I've circled the blue writing is, is me um, typing in answers here. And then uh, for the plant species that are actually in bloom, we want you to record, um, uh, sorry, just one second. We want you to record the common name and species name if you know them, and then take a photo of the plant because if the, take a photo of any plant that bumblebees were visiting that you caught, um, because you, we're gonna ask you to show us that photo when you upload the, uh, the bumblebee itself. More on that in a minute. And then um, when we get do get to the, the bumblebee observations, it looks like this. 
Uh, so it's a table and um, you see we could um, enter the Latin name, bumblebee species. Um, you can give us the common name if that's your thing. Um, and then we want to know what plant you got the bee from. So uh, here I have examples. I wrote lupin species. Let's imagine I knew it was a lupin, but I didn't know what species. Um, or in the next example, I knew it was Ariagum fasciculatum, right? Or you can say yellow flower, see photos. Um, really, really importantly, you need to record, uh, you need to have a method for linking the photos of the bees to this data. So row one says Bombus fervidus, and I took a bunch of photos of it. And maybe I don't enter my data for, for two weeks or two months or something. I still need to go back to my camera roll and find the, the exact photos of that bee. And it can get complicated when you, you're handling a lot of bees. So some folks will use the photo ID that they, their camera gives them. Um, I, I use an iPhone and I find it's hard to get the, the actual code name of the, of the, the, the picture um, without downloading it. And so um, my method is I just write down the time of day that I finished taking photos of that bee. So you can see the third row that it says bee crotchy eye. It was on a penstemon. Um, I wrote 2.34 p.m. So let's say at 2.32 p.m. I started photographing this bee. And then when I was done with it and it started flying away, I just looked at my watch and recorded 2.34 p.m. So later when I go to my photo roll, it's really easy to just go to the right date and then zoom to 2.34 p.m. And then look at that burst of photos that happened for 120 seconds before that. For me, that's a super efficient way to do it. It may vary for you. And so just, you can use any method, but please understand that it's really important that you do have a plan um, for this or it'll be a giant headache later. All right, so taking that data and entering it to Bumblebee Watch. Um, this is a little different uh, than last year, as I'll say in a minute. Um, all of the data is going to go to bumblebeewatch.org. This is a website that's separate from the California Bumblebee Atlas website, and it's where all of our Bumblebee data goes. Um, I, I encourage you to do this as soon as you can after field work, but um, you know sometimes you can wait and, and do it later, but it, it does get harder with time. <laughs> Um, keep a good record of which photos go with each bee, as I just said. Um, and so you're going to submit the top four or five photos of the bee, right? So the most useful ones, they may be the most beautiful ones, but they also may be less beautiful, uh, but more um, revealing of the certain things we want to see, the face or whatever. Um, and then uh, uh, if you get a photo of the host plant, please include that as one of the five photos that you'll upload, as I'll describe in a sec. So Bumblebee Watch just had a, re, a relaunch. We've completely rebuilt, rebuilt it. It looks pretty similar to the old Bumblebee Watch, but it does have increased functionality. We've fixed um, just about all of the bugs and it's just a much better platform for data entry. So if this was your frustration with the California Bumblebee Atlas last year, I hope it will not be this year. Um, personally, I think it's really a big improvement. Um, so there's that website, bumblebeewatch.org. You'll need to make a quick little account, which is basically your your um, your email address, your password, and a, a, a name. Um, as you'll see, it takes two minutes. So you'll log in, um, and you'll see this screen. This is the home page, and um, I want to introduce two terms that we use all the time on Bumblebee Watch, but maybe counterintuitive to some folks. So a checklist. A checklist is a survey. It is. Um, you know, sort of a list of bees that we saw, but we explicitly mean a checklist is a site where we stopped for some amount of time and we collected bees. So it's either a 45 minute point survey or a 15 minute roadside roadside survey stop. That is a checklist. Um, and uh, and so you some people will call it a survey. Second, a sighting. That is an observation of a bumblebee. Okay, so um, I mean it's kind of obvious, but we use the word sighting. So you can see on the on the uh, image here we have add sightings, explore sightings, and so on. I just want to clarify that's what those things mean. Um, and if you're a biologist, you may use different terminology for um, for sites and um, observations or specimens or what have you. In any case, let's imagine we're going to now go through the process of adding data. So I've circled where it says add sightings. You'll click there. And that is to begin the process. It will take you to this page uh, where we're asked to select our project. There are two projects here that I want you to use. Um, on the left, it's called Bumblebee Watch, and that is only for incidentals. So again, those pictures you take uh, of the BUC while going to the grocery store or in the park or something. 
uh, while you're doing other stuff. So click Bumblebee Watch if you want to submit an incidental survey. If you are submitting a point survey or a roadside survey, we want you to click Bumblebee Atlas on the right here. And this is slightly different from last year. Last year, we had a drop-down list where we asked you to choose California Bumblebee Atlas. This time, just choose Bumblebee Atlas here. And that's the same for all the projects across the many states. Uh, you do see another menu at the bottom that says, or select from our regional projects. Do not do so. <laughs> there is, There may be a little California Bumblebee Atlas in there. We don't want you to select that. This is actually a menu that we're developing for um, sort of side projects where a small nonprofit wants to do something and they ask, can we have a project and we set one up. So for you, uh, the project, if you're doing point and roadside surveys, it's called Bumblebee Atlas on the upper right there, not, um, not the drop down menu at the bottom. Okay, so after you, uh, you do this, uh, you click either submit sightings on either side, you'll go to this page. And this is where we add the habitat data, the site data. So first um, you're, gonna ch you're gonna add your location if you've already done a survey at this site in the past, Bumblebee Watch will re remember that and you can type in, or sorry, you can click choose from your locations and you'll get a drop down list and you'll pick the right one and it will populate all the other stuff. Um, but if it's a new site to you, you're gonna name it uh, where it says name. I wrote Morgan Hill, I just made that up. Um, whatever you wanna call it is fine. I usually choose a site name that is meaningful to me so that I can, Get back to it easily later, um, but is also sort of meaningful to someone who's un, uninitiated. It, it's a it's a place name. Um, it refers to a road or some other transportation infrastructure. Um, so um, that's up to you. But those are some suggestions. Um, you're going to either select on a map in the blue there uh, where that that place is, and you'll you'll put a little um, a little point down on the location, and it will populate the latitude and longitude. I believe you can instead just enter latitude and longitude raw there and it will um, it'll bring up the map and put it in the right place. Um, uh, and then we want to know um, how accurate was that uh, was that location? Is it within 25 to 50 meters of the actual location? Is it closer or less close? So you'll just choose from a drop down menu there. Now we want to know, know about when you did the, the sighting. Um, so uh, put in the date. Uh, and then uh, the next thing down, you see it says um, survey type. And um, so you'll choose here a point survey or a roadside survey or an incidental survey if you're on the other side um, uh, that I described in the previous slide. Moving down the page, you can I've just sort of scrolled and you can see point surveys at the top now. Um, now we want to know about the collection methods. Um, did you capture all bees that you observed? And for the vast majority of us, that's the answer. As I said earlier, we don't want to do the other option where you catch one bee of each species and then you start counting. Um, and then tell us how many hectares you surveyed. There are some sites where you don't have a, a full hectare um, and that's fine. Just do your best to estimate the area and tell us that. If it's 0.5, if it's 0.25, that's great. Um, if it's bigger, that's fine too. Um, there are cases where bigger is okay, but understand that if you get much bigger than one hectare, um, you probably won't visit all parts of it. And so it's functionally a smaller survey area anyway. Uh, tell us the number of surveyors. It's often just you and right, record one there. Um, we, for some reason, we're not asking for the names of those folks, even though on the data sheet we do. So you don't have to tell us who was surveying, just tell us how many of you there were. And then again, there's the survey start and end time, the net uh, length insert in minutes. And then below, we're asking for some environmental conditions. So um, what was the temperature? What units are you expressing that in? What's the cloud cover? What's the wind speed? And if you don't have an anemometer on you, you can estimate the wind speed. You estimate the cloud cover. Um, so these things, uh, you know, they'll vary a bit between the various folks who are part of the project, but just do your best. Next, and this is still the same page, we're just scrolling. Uh, we're going to ask for that habitat type, which was on the data sheet. So you'll choose your main habitat type for the survey area. And then if you recorded others, give us those others as you go down there. Um, it looks to me, this is news to me, it looks like this the primary habitat type of the surrounding area is required, meaning it's, it has an asterisk there. Uh, uh, so make sure to record the habitat around your focal habitat, even if it's the same type um, for recording here. Uh, as we move down here, you see at the bottom how much of the survey area has flower resources available. You'll remember that was on the data sheet. 
And we will then move into those nesting resources. And then below that, we have the management stuff about evidence of grazing and pesticide use. Mm -hmm. Then we wanna know how many flower species were there in the site. So just count them up and tell us. And then below that, we want you to tell us about those flowers. So um, we ask for either the common name or the scientific name or both if you want for plant number one and then plant number two. And there's space for 15 or more plants. Um, I don't think you need to go past 15. And in most cases, we don't have more than 15. Uh, same scrolling the same page again. Um, this is the end of that page, just below the plants. And, and by the way, when you tell us the number of flowering species, it will populate the number of plants that you need to fill out. So if you said 15, you'd get a much longer list here. At the bottom, we want some information about you, the volunteer, um, not personal information, but we want to know, uh, was this survey a volunteer effort? And for most of you, the answer will be yes. Um, and then some stuff about training. Then importantly, there's that null survey question. This is a null survey. Again, that means I did a survey, I did everything right, and the bees did not get in the net. Um, please tell us that. Please enter the data and then click this, this uh, uh, box here. And then you're signing at the bottom, uh, attesting that this is your data basically, and that it's accurate. Um, you'll click submit at the bottom uh, right there. And this will take you to a new page where we uh, where we update, we add the photos of the bees. So we're doing this serially. So for bee number one, this is the page and we'll go through this together. And then at the bottom, you see it says add citing. Uh, and that's that means go to the next bee, okay? So if you add five bees, you're gonna fill out this, this page five times, but you're gonna add photos of each bee differently for each of the five, if that makes sense. So first, uh, you, you'll click select photos, and you'll go to your drive, and you'll you'll upload those photos. You can also drag and drop. This works pretty well. It's it's um, pretty quick. Uh, we want you to tell us what the species is, and we understand that you are not necessarily an expert in this, um, and it's fine if you get this wrong. I will look at every single bee and and decide what I think it is, um, but we do want um, we want to know what you think it is. Give us your best guess, and I'm going to talk about some resources that you can use for that um, in just a minute. We want to know the count. So how many bees does this set of photos represent? Again, for the vast majority of us, just it's just one bee, right? Because you're not catching a, a single bee of a species and then counting all the others that you saw. You're actually count your every bee you collect is a separate page here. Um, Reference ID is uh, if you put it on iNaturalist already and you want to record the link to that, you can put something in there. Tell us the sex, and you're going to learn how to distinguish those in a minute. Tell us the floral host of this bee. So this should be a plant that's on your list of plants, um, but this is the, the plant that you swung the net at and got the bee from. And there's a, a field for giving us observation notes, and that's up to you, whatever it is. At the bottom, there's a box for private. Um, this will obscure location information from other users of the data. Um, there's a privacy policy on the website under that resources tab, and I encourage you to read it, especially if you want to be clicking private. Um, it's still possible that the data will go out of the door to some users, um, even if you mark it private. Uh, for example, CDFW gets the whole file, but we're not going to give your private records to the general public is basically what that means. So if it's your backyard and you don't want people knowing that the bee occurred there, just click private and that should do it. When you're done with this, you'll click add citing. And if it's your last bee, you're done. If you have another bee, you'll do the exact same thing again for that other bee. As I said, the average number of bees in a survey is seven. Um, but we've seen up to 80 or something. I don't think you're going to get more than um, 40, even if you are very, very fast. So most of us, it's less than 20 and, and often fewer than 10, at least in California work. So uh, these are my explainers. So you'll click add citing at the end. And uh, that is it. So um, here's a quick summary so of, of everything. So you'll adopt a good cell. You'll plan your pointer roadside survey. You'll conduct your survey according to these methods. And then later, you'll enter the data um, to Bumblebee Watch. And so just before we end this section, I'm going to show you some resources that may help you. Um, here is the participant handbook, um, an outdated version from 2021. But there's an updated version on the website on the project resources page 
Uh, below that, you see this little one page field guide. It's actually two pages. Um, that's something I made for the project. It has one or two pictures of each species in the state, and they're broken out by gross color patterns. It's a good place to start if you don't know bumblebees. It's not sufficient for identifying them all, but that's okay. It's a good place to start to understand color patterns. There's an image of our website there and then our Facebook group, which is a private group, and um, I encourage you to um, to uh, to join us. And it's a place where people post photos, questions, lots of questions. Um, people help each other as much as I help anyone um, or others help anyone. It's a nice community where uh, volunteers are talking to each other. So that's, that's there. Um, sorry, to get to that, uh, you look for um, Bumblebee Atlas on Facebook. And then one of our groups is called California Bumblebee Atlas. Uh, identification resources. These are the two best books. Um, and um, this is shameless self-promotion because I'm a co-author on the one on the left, but it is the best available book right now for identification of bumblebees. Um, uh, the one in the middle is a free download from the US Forest Service. You can find it on the Xerces website and you can easily find it elsewhere. It's called Bumblebees of the Western United States and it is very good also. Mm -hmm. Um, Bug Guide is the website at the upper right, and um, below you see Bumblebee Watch. That's actually the old look. And then you see iNaturalist there. iNaturalist is a fantastic resource in all kinds of ways, including as an aid, as sort of a field guide for, um, for Bumblebee Atlas folks. And um, there is a field guide on Bumblebee Watch, by the way. Uh, but then this paper, it, it, you can find it for free online, um, downloadable. It's called Bumblebees and Cuckoo Bumblebees of California, written by that guy, Dr. Robin Thorpe, whose photo I showed you, and his colleagues. And this is from 1983, so it's very outdated. However, it is still very relevant and has a lot of great information about California bumblebees. So search that out if you want, and it's it'll take a little bit more doing to get into. It's an academic peer-reviewed publication, but it is a good one. So uh, briefly, I'll talk about environmental compliance, and then we will wrap up this middle section and take a quick break. Um, so uh, you are going to need to think about bald and golden eagle protection. Um, and so there are some specific guidelines about this. You're going to hear about them when you take the quiz. That is the last step before you become permitted. Um, so I'm not going to talk about them now. Um, you need to avoid certain sensitive habitats. Again, you'll hear about those. There are some other precautions having to do with disease spread for, for rabbits and some other things. Um, we operate under a scientific collecting permit from CDFW, as well as a memorandum of understanding that is um, necessary. And you're going to get copies of both of those when you become permitted. Um, and they will. you need to read them carefully, and they'll spell out a bunch of detail about what we can and cannot do in the project. Again, all of this will be covered for in a 20 minute video that you'll watch as you start the quiz. So um, that's where you'll get some of the meat of this, uh, what I'm just, um, I'm just giving you a thumbnail sketch of right now. So uh, finally, uh, this is email addresses for our colleagues, Hillary Sardinius and Dylan Winkler at CDFW. Um, they are um, important members of this project but are stepping back just a little bit this year because our funding now comes mainly from BLM as opposed to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So if you have any questions about environmental compliance stuff, Hillary would be the first go-to person and Dylan the second. Um, and if you wanna read more about the SCP itself, there's, um, there's a website there that you could check out. So with that, we are going to take a five minute break. Um, actually, sorry, let's, let's do a few questions and then we will do the break. Um, I see we have just enough time to do this. I'm gonna stop sharing um, and okay. Uh, so I'm just going to choose a few of them at random. I haven't looked at them yet. Um, someone says, are you really looking at every bee photo? Amazingly, yes. <laughs> there were 6,770 so of them this year, and it took a few months, but we look at every single record and all the photos in the record. Um, it, it goes faster and faster as you get good at it, but it is, it is a, a lot of work. Um, let's see. Rachel asks, would a survey be a volunteer effort on the Bumblebee Watch form if you're a federal employee surveying on the clock? Oh, good question. Um, yes. Uh, what we mean by volunteer at that place um, is basically, are you a, a CDFW employee or a Xerces employee versus are you a project participant 
like yourself who's being trained in one of these webinars. So even if you're doing this on the clock for your um, your public land employer, um, from our perspective, you're a volunteer to our project. I hope that makes sense. Um, and by the way, we use that. This is also important to tell you as a federal employee. Um, we use that information to calculate the match that we can use against um, or towards our, uh, our various funding. So for some of our grants, we need to come up with a bunch of um, in-kind contributions in the form of labor contributions and mileage contributions. And this is why we're asking for that information. Um, so if you don't think that your, uh, your work with us counts in that way or is going to be a double count because you also report it to your federal employer, then you should not tell us that you're a volunteer. Okay. Um, do you have recommendations for vials to use for these surveys? Good question. And yes, we do. Uh, there is a page on the website called Project Resources. I think that's where it is. You'll see photos of vials and nets and other uh, materials. And we have some suggestions of places you can buy them and just a little bit of information about what size vial to look for. Vials are easy to come by on Amazon or just about you know many other places. Uh, and people have different um, different preferences for them. Um, let's see. Uh, someone says, do we need to warm the bees before releasing? How do we do that? No, actually what you do um, is you'll dump the bee out of its vial and it's anesthetized by the cold. You can put it in your hand and it can't move, it can't sting, it can't fly, or put it on your notebook or something else. You'll take your photos and um, when you're done with the bee, you're usually done with the bee before the bee has woken up. I will just move it to the corner of the of the notebook and get the next bee. And I'll just keep doing this. I will end up with a pile of 10 bees and they're all sort of twitching and getting waking up. And um, every last one will eventually stand up and start walking around and then we'll fly off. So you don't need to do anything to help them wake up. Um, the only thing is don't put them in a really hot direct sun kind of situation. I think that could stress them given that they're coming back from torpor and it's a, you know, it's probably something that... Uh, <laughs> that uh, is going to um, be harder on them if you put them in the hot sun. Um, okay, let's see, one more question. Anne asks, is it better to return to my past locations from 2022 and 2023 or to go to new locations? Uh, I guess it depends. Um, on the one hand, we would love it if you go to new locations, especially if they happen to be BLM properties because that helps us with some of the deliverables for the funding for the project. Um, and it helps us go to new places in the state. So getting away from the familiar places and the places where more people live is always um, great for the project. Uh, I don't know where you live, Anne, but um, just in general. But on the other hand, um, it's absolutely fine if you wanna use the same sites as you did last year or two years ago. And if you think about it, this is really valuable data from the perspective of the kind of scientists on the other side me and my colleagues, when we look at the data and we try to think about B um, declines or increases, if we have data from three consecutive years at the same sites, we can do something with that that we cannot do with other data. So I didn't answer your question definitively. And what I mean is um, it's up to you, but uh, there is value in both of those options. Okay, let's take a five minute break. Uh, okay, welcome back to the third and final module of the California Bumblebee Atlas training workshop. We're going to get started. All right, so this module is about identifying California bumblebees. And uh, this will be somewhat of a cursory introduction to identification. There are 25 species, and we can't teach all of them tonight. Uh, but we can, uh, what we're going to do is um, teach you how to figure out if it's a bumblebee. And then uh, uh, we're going to teach you about the rare species and their lookalikes. So we'll get exposure to about half of the species in California. Um, and so we've been through the previous two modules. Um, you've seen this photo, but uh, we like to just ground this identification research in or, or work in the um, history of research on California bumblebees. And this man, Dr. Robin Thorpe from UC Davis, played a strong role in this and um, uh, figured out many of the relationships among California bumblebees. Uh, he pointed out the first signs of decline for the rarest of bumblebees here, Bombus franklini, and was a mentor to some of us. Um, at Circe's. So before we move on, we need to look at this graphic again and talk a little bit about bumblebee morphology. Remember, there are three body segments, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The abdomen, as you can see in this, gra this graphic, is 
composed of um, tergites or terga, and we abbreviate that as T, so T1 through T6 on a female bee, and this is an image of a female. Uh, the head, as I've said, has the face where we see hair between the uh, compound eyes. It also has the vertex, the top of the head near the simple eyes, and there's hair there that we're, we care about the color of. Um, we've talked about the cheek and we will more so in just a minute. Um, and then the antenna are composed of uh, 12 or 13 segments. And those little segments are called flagella or together we call it the flagellum. You will sometimes hear about uh, antennal characters when you're trying to do identification of bumblebees. Uh, the cheek is very important. It is one of the only morphological characters uh, other than hair color and length that we can use to distinguish bumblebees from each other. So it's um, in some species, it's quite short and some it's long and many it's about uh, equally long as wide. And so the two arrows are showing you the two dimensions that we care about. The vertical one is from the bottom of the compound eye to the top of the um, where the hinges of the mandible are. And you can see the left mandible is kind of hidden, but you can see the right mandible folding over it. And it's, that's that toothed structure at the bottom of the head. So the hinges of that thing up to the eye, that's the length of the cheek. Second, we want to figure out what is the width of the cheek. And for that, we measure from hinge to hinge, inclusive of the hinge itself. Um, and so in this case, this is uh, the rusty patch bumblebee, which does not occur in California. But in this species, uh, the cheek is shorter than it is wide, which I think you can see from the way I've made the arrows here. Um, and so in California, we have some species that are like this. We have some that have a very long cheek relative to its width and many that are right in the middle. This characteristic is tricky and it takes a bit of time and experience, but I encourage you to try to photograph it uh, from a perpendicular angle when you do take photos of it so that the dimensions are not skewed by the, uh, by the angle that you take the photo at. And, um, and start to ask yourself, can I see that it's either longer or shorter than it is wide? Okay, so we're gonna use this simplified flow chart to get from mystery insect to bumblebee and further. So um, it's again, pretty simplistic, but we're gonna show you some of the different characteristics that distinguish bees from other insects, bumblebees from other bees, males and females, and then the cuckoo bumblebees from the non-cuckoo bumblebees within males and females. So we'll go through, we'll walk through the various tiers of this chart, and then we will get to uh, looking at actual species and talking about how they, how they differ from others. So first, is it a bee or is it some other kind of insect? Uh, so here are five images of insects. Is it a bee? Um, I, this is not a poll question, but you can form uh, your guess. And um, I will tell you that four of them are flies and only one of them's a bee. And the one that is a bee is the one that looks the least like a bee in the popular conception of a, of a furry striped, maybe black and yellow insect. Um, that is in fact a bee. Uh, it's just um, one that doesn't have a lot of hair and happens to look a bit like a wasp. You can see many flies resemble bees and this is not an accident. We think that they actually evolve to appear similar to bees, which may uh, spare them from predators who know that bees can sting them. Um, and I think it's funny, this uh, Bees of the World is a book, a really authoritative manual on bees. Um, and unfortunately, even the editor was not able to pick a photo of a bee and they put a fly on the book. Um, happily, the second edition, um, they put an actual bee, a bumblebee on the cover of the bee book. So this is difficult. It's difficult for people sh who should know better and it may be difficult for you as well. Um, but let's talk about a few of the characteristics of bees that separate them from those other insects. So uh, bees evolved from a wasp-like ancestor, and so did wasps. The key distinction between those ancient wasps and ancient bees is that the bees stopped using animal protein as the protein source for growing new bees, for reproduction. Instead, their protein shifted to being pollen from flowers. And wasps, with a few rare exceptions, all uh, use animal protein to this day as the protein source for making more wasps. So bees are vegetarians and that distinguishes them from uh, most of their closest relatives. It's an unusual sort of uh, trait that evolved. It allowed this great radiation, uh, evolutionary radiation of both the bees and the flowers um, as mutualists. 
So um, bees, uh, given that bees have these morphological adaptations and behaviors also to harvest and carry pollen. We've talked about the pollen basket of bumblebees, also known as a scopa. And here is a bee in the bottom left, which is in the genus Megachile. Um, it's quite removed from bumblebees and honeybees. This bee does not carry pollen on her hind leg like the bumblebees. In fact, she carries the pollen on the underside of her abdomen. And you can see that yellow stuff is the pollen and it's all jammed into a brush of hairs. And it's not usually moistened as in the case of the bumblebees. Um, it's electrostatic energy that is holding the the. Um, uh, the pollen into that scopa. Um, bees tend to have long tongues relative to wasps and flies, and this reflects their dependence on nectar um, from flowers. Um, let's see, so another thing in the center here, um, bees have branched hairs, and this is not easy to appreciate in the field, but you can sometimes see it with a hand lens and certainly with a microscope. And so somewhere on the body of the bee, you will find hair, even if only a little, and some of that hair will always be branched. Um, that's not the case for most of the relatives, including wasps and flies. So this is a, this takes some practice and maybe an instrument, but um, this bushiness sort of is reflected in the overall gestalt look of the bee. It's the hairs are not thin and um, um, individual so much as they're sort of a packed, um, uh, they're packed together. And that might reflect some of the, the feathering that we may not be able to see with the naked eye. Um, it's important to understand that some bees carry pollen internally, and so you won't know that they're carrying pollen. And second, that many bees don't harvest and carry pollen at all. So male bees do not carry pollen around. Um, they may eat some in flowers, but they're not going to harvest it and remove it to somewhere else. And then many bees are, um, are parasites of other bees, and those bees do not collect their own pollen. So let's assume that that was enough for us to figure out that this uh, mystery insect that we have is a bee and not some other type of insect. Now let's try to figure out, is it a bumblebee or is it one of the other many other types of bees? So here are some lookalikes in California for bumblebees. The one on the left is a really cool animal. The genus is Centris and we call them oil bees. This is a large bodied furry bee that you'll find in the deserts, uh, the Mojave. And elsewhere, um, this bee is dependent on plants that make not only nectar and pollen as attractants for pollinators, but also floral oils. And so this bee has adaptations for gathering those oils, carrying them home, and then feeding them to the larva, as well as pollen and nectar. Um, so this bee uh, can be distinguished from bumblebees by looking at those hind legs. This is a female, and you can see she has a big brush of black hairs. She does not have that shiny hairless area with bristles attending it on the sides like a bumblebee. And that's a dead giveaway that you're looking at a, a different type of bee. Let's move to the next one, which is a carpenter bees or xylocopa. And everyone is probably familiar with these, the large bodied or medium bodied um, mostly black bees in California, although there's one species where the male is bright orange. It's really a beautiful animal. Um, these are a common, a common in um, developed areas, so we often encounter them. Um, a principal difference from bumblebees is that they're not going to have striping. So many of our bumblebees will have a black background and then um, some stripes across the thorax and the abdomen, uh, just generally speaking. And you won't see that in the carpenter bees, at least not those that occur here. In California. Uh, the next bee on this slide is honeybees, and honeybees are smaller in general than bumblebees, and they're less hairy, um, but sometimes people will think it's a small bumblebee. So um, honeybees have this distinctive banding of, of um, golden sort of tan colors and darker colors on the abdomen. Notice that the colors are not hair, but they're actually the color of the skin or the integument of the animal. Um, and that's different from those bumblebees. Um, by the way, honeybees do in fact have a, a pollen basket like bumblebees. So this is important. There are a few other types of bees that have a pollen basket. Um, and so that you will not uh, notice a difference in honeybees uh, with respect to bumblebees. The last one on this slide is what we call digger bees and they're the genus Anthophora. These are common, large bodied, widespread California species that um, it's one of the bees that you'll notice in your backyard um, or um, around town or something. They uh, also resemble bumblebees. They're large and hairy, 
but like the first one I described, they do not have a, a pollen basket. Their scopa is a thick brush of hairs. And in this individual, you can see she's carrying pollen. She's packed all this dry pollen into that bristle, that bristle brush of hairs, as opposed to the way the bumblebees do it, where they moisten the pollen with nectar, stick it on that shiny hairless area, and the bristles overlap to kind of hold it as if it were a basket. So look at, let's look at some bumblebee characteristics um, with respect to that last slide. Uh, so bumblebees tend to be large and quite hairy with a robust body. They can be kind of blocky and chunky. Um, they're not usually long and skinny like uh, a honeybee. Um, uh, they are in, as I said, in California, they're usually black with yellow um, colors, uh, also sort of bands across the black. Um, but we also see orange, brown, and red hues in California bumblebees. And we see a lot of variation in hair color. So um, the pollen basket on the hind legs, which we've talked about, also called a corbicula, um, that's a special thing for bumblebees, honeybees, and just a few other types of bees. Um, and the uh, photo in the bottom right is a bumblebee, but it's a male bumblebee. And so notice he does not have a pollen basket. So this could trick you, but remember that males are out there too and um, they are morphologically a bit different from the females. So let's assume that we uh, got to, yes, it is a bumblebee. And here I want to point out the gray boxes with some ID resources. Um, on the left are three websites that are great for bees, as well as all sorts of other insects. Uh, Bugguide.net, um, Discover Life, um, and you'll have to navigate to the bee section of that website, and iNaturalist. These are great resources that you can use as digital field guides. Um, you can learn about ranges and historical collections, plant associations, and more. Um, on the right, we have some other, uh, some overlapping resources for bumblebees. So I include those three digital resources. Also the Bumblebees of North America field guide and the Bumblebees of Western US, of the Western US field guide, which are really great for, um, for the bumblebees. So now let's learn to separate males and females. So in this image, uh, we have the same species. We have the male on the left, the female on the right. Um, and this is Bombus griseocollis. Uh, it's a widespread species that occurs in California only in the northernmost um, counties. Uh, it comes as far south as Arcata Marsh on the west side of the state and somewhere around maybe Truckee on the east side of the state. Just a few records here and there. So it's not very common in the state, but it is a lovely bee that you may encounter if you're up there. So. Um, the, the, the bulleted points here are males versus females. Whoops. Um, so males have seven abdominal segments as opposed to six, um, on the female, uh, the male has no, no, um, pollen basket or a corbicula, um, whatsoever. Uh, and the male has 13 antennal segments rather than 12 in the female. Females have a stinger and males have a sort of a wedge shaped rounded or squared off end to their abdomen. Um, and if you can see inside that little opening, you'll see their genitalia. You will not see a sting. Um, sometimes they leave it open when they're anesthetized by cold. Um, so the males are often shaggier than their female counterparts, but not always. They often have bigger eyes than the females, but not always. Depends on the species. Um, and the color patterns in this example are broadly similar, um, but and there are a few species where they're quite a lot different. Um, one that comes to mind in California is Van Dyke bumblebee, which you can look up and actually we'll see a, an example of um, a little bit later in this talk. So let's assume you can distinguish a male bumblebee from a female bumblebee. The last thing we need to do is decide if it's a cuckoo bumblebee or a non-cuckoo bumblebee. And again, I've used this word citherus here, which means um, it's the cuckoo bumblebees. Uh, and so we're going to use the, um, the hind leg where the pollen is carried in non-cuckoo bumblebee females to distinguish these four classes of bees. So here it is. Uh, at the top, we'll use the males first. This is what the cuckoo bumblebee's leg looks like. It is narrower. It is convex to somewhat flat. There is no shiny area in the middle that is that is smooth. It is shining a little, but it's stippled. It's rugose. Um, it's lots of little um, raised bits on the integument or the skin of the bee. And then there are hairs on the edge, but they are not a, a bristle brush that arcs over the top of where pollen would be. Uh, let's compare to the non-cuckoo bumblebee male, who also does not have a, a pollen basket on that segment of his leg. His leg is a little wider than the cuckoo bumblebee males, 
and you can see a narrow area in the center that is that is smooth and it could be a bit shiny, but you do also see lots of rugosity or bumpiness on um, this, this flat or even convex area in the middle. And then you see the bristles, but they're not very big on the outside. Um, and so this is definitely a male and not a female. Um, here's the female cuckoo bumblebee. And remember, they do not collect pollen. They thus do not have the adaptation to carry it. And so here's what the hind leg of that female looks like. Um, it is convex to flat-ish. It has no uh, smooth area. It looks like a sort of mildly shiny here. They're often dull overall. Um, and there are bristles on the sides, but they're not long and arcing. And finally, let's look at the um, non-cuckoo bumblebee female. These are the ones that do gather and carry pollen. And you can see that most of the segment is um, shiny and smooth. And um, it is at least partway concave. If you look at it really closely, it varies a little across its surface. Um, and it has this really, these pronounced stiff bristles that um, can be engaged to hold that pollen in place. So this will take a little experience, but I think you're going to start seeing it once you um, look at some bees and you'll notice the differences. All right, so let's uh, let's move from um, figuring out if we have a bumblebee um, and what sex it is um, and what group it is in um, to actually trying to figure out species. So this is a little two-pager um, introduction to identification I made for California bumblebees, where each species that we have is represented by one or at most two images in this graph. And they're separated into these five course categories. Uh, number one is bees that have some orange or red on them. Number two is they have stripes. And the first abdominal segment, which we call T1, is yellow, and so on. You can see the, the key there. Um, um, this is not adequate for all identification, but it's a good place to start if you're new to this stuff. And as I said before, we are going to take the, um, the uh, species that are candidates for listing um, in California as our examples. We'll look at uh, sort of a field guide page of those, and then we'll look at um, other species that are on this page that may look similar. And likely they'll come from the, the same uh, of the five categories here. Uh, one example to the right here is Suckley bumblebee, and we'll see her again. So first is Franklin bumblebee, or sometimes Franklin's bumblebee. It's Bombus franklini. This bee occurs in extreme Northern California in the, the Klamath and Siskiyou Mountains. Um, in adjacent Oregon in an area about 120 miles long and maybe 70 miles wide. This is the only place on earth that this bee occurs. Um, it has one of the smallest ranges of any bumblebee that we know of. And um, unfortunately, it is extremely rare. So rare, in fact, that we have not seen it since 2006, despite looking. It's federally listed as endangered and a candidate for listing in California. It's truly um, a, a, a ghost of sorts, and it may well still be out there. Um, and hopefully the bumblebee atlas can um, contribute to relocating it. I want you to notice, well, you can't see it, but the head will have yellowish hair on it, sometimes darker hair um, on the face and vertex. The shoulders will have yellow hair as depicted here. They have, uh, and then the thorax has this nice little horseshoe shape of black hair that goes into that front shoulder yellow hair. Uh, you can see it in the photo somewhat, and you can see it in the, the graphics. Um, the rest of the thorax is black. Most of the abdomen is black, with the exception of minor areas of yellow hair on the fifth abdominal segment, T5. And you can see sort of fringes on the edge there, but it is not, in most cases, a full band of yellow across there. Um, this bee will have a short cheek. This is an important distinction that if you ever get to handle one, um, you're going to make sure to take a photo. Uh, if you think it might be Franklin's bumblebee, you've got to take a photo of that cheek. Uh, here's another related species that uh, looks somewhat similar to Franklin's um, and is also a candidate for listing. So this is the Western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis. Um, it's a candidate for listing in the state, but it is also um, being assessed for listing by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as endangered or threatened. We expect a decision on that within the next 12 months, um, and that uh, decision may um, affect our work in some ways. Um, this bee uh, if, is found around the western part of North America, uh, and it uh, formerly was quite common in California on the coast, at least as far south as Monterey Bay perhaps a little farther, and also in the mountains in the north, as well as the Sierras 
And you can see from this map that the in the modern time period that I've mapped here, it's a little bit outdated, but uh, we have almost no records from the coast. This bee has disappeared from the San Francisco Bay Area and all other parts uh, coastal in California and Oregon, and I think in most of Washington as well. We're not sure what's going on, but this bee has crashed in many places. It's still moderately common where it occurs in the in the Rockies, say in Colorado and elsewhere, um, but it is a real uh, conservation concern. So this one has uh, black or somewhat mixed black and yellow hair on the face. Uh, it has black hair on the vertex. It has a short cheek, just like its relative Franklin's bumblebee. Um, it will usually have uh, black hair across a band um, in, in the middle of the thorax. And then with us, it usually does not have a yellow scutellum, which is the back area of the thorax. This bee here has just a little yellow hair at the back of the thorax below the arrow. Um, uh, but mostly they're going to just be black there. The first abdominal segment is black. Then we usually see yellow stripes, although in many cases we do not see yellow stripes. And then at the tip of the tail, um, the fourth, fifth, and or sixth segments, we're going to see um, hair color that's very light. It's usually white as depicted in the images. However, in California, it can sometimes be a creamy light yellow color as depicted in this photograph and in some of those graphics. Um, and so this one uh, is, we have found it about 10 to 15 times in the California bumblebee atlas uh, in the Northern Sierras and a few other spots, but it is truly rare. And we're hoping to um, really understand where it still persists in the state. Let's talk about some bees that look similar to those two. So in California, many species are black with some yellow banding. Um, here are the so-called yellow-faced bumblebees. Uh, it's three related species. They're not closely related to the Westerns and Franklin, but they do look very similar. And um, in some cases, you cannot distinguish the top one and the bottom one. The top one is called Bombus caliginosus or fog belt bumblebee. The one on the bottom is Vosnesensky bumblebee or Bombus vosnesenskii. Uh, those two are, uh, their color patterns are almost identical. And so we look at hair length and the presence of a few scattered yellow hairs in one place on one bee, but not on the other. They're quite hard to distinguish. And they do co-occur um, in the Western part of the state and to some extent in the central part of the state. Um, and so in those places, uh, it is hard for us to identify the two species. Um, but you can see there's a third species here called Van Dyke bumblebee or Bombus van Dykei. It also has a similar color pattern. So basically, um, these, these bees have yellow facial hair and vertex hair. They have yellow shoulders. They're mostly black otherwise with a yellow stripe on for the top one and the bottom one on T4 and for the middle one on T3, but it often looks very similar. So these three can be mistaken for uh, Franklin's or for Western bumblebee. Um, once you get, uh, get some experience, it's pretty easy to distinguish them from those two, but, um, um, for beginners, it's not necessarily so. Here's another one that can be can be um, confused for either of those uh, those any of those three plus Franklin's and Western. Um, this is Bombus fervidus. It's also known as Bombus californicus in California, although that name is a junior synonym to fervidus, and so taxonomists have lumped them under the latter name, not californicus. So we call it Bombus fervidus here. Um, notice it's a black, largely black bee with two yellow stripes on it, just like the others we've been talking about. However, this one has some differences. It is it has um, distinctly black hair on the face in the females. Um, sometimes the males have a little yellow. Uh, it does have a yellow shoulder, um, and the, most of the rest of the bee is black except for a stripe on T4. Uh, an important distinction for this one is it has a distinctly long cheek, um, and so it's much longer than wide. And uh, the previous three species, it's about equal. And for those other two, the two rare ones that I just discussed, they are shorter than they are wide. Um, so yeah, this bee is, it often tricks people, but um, if you look for that black facial hair on the females and the long face, you will, just, you will notice it is just not the same bee as the others we've been talking about. One more that you could be confused for Western bumblebee, um, uh, by beginners anyway, is Sitka bumblebee. It is largely a coastal thing, and the dots in the Sierras on the map may not be legitimate records. It's mostly found on the coast uh, all the way to Alaska, um, and in a few places it does go inward, uh, in inland. Um, for example, it's found in Idaho, 
uh, and most of Washington state. So it does go quite a distance inland there, but for the most part, it's this distribution right along the coast. And the reason it can be uh, mistaken for Western bumblebee is that it does have a very pale hair at the tip of the tail, uh, a light creamy yellow, sometimes it's almost white, but you'll notice that the rest of the color pattern is quite a bit different. It has lots of mixed black and yellow hair on the thorax, a lot of black hair in general. And then the first abdominal segment is yellow, not black like those two. So this one shouldn't be too tricky, but people will sometimes get confused, get fooled by uh, that pale hair at the tip of the tail. Um, so this the, the cheek on this one is about as long as wide, maybe slightly longer. Um, there's lots of mixed up black and yellow hair on the thorax, yellow on T1, and then that pale hair at the tip of the tail. Let's move on to another rare species and its lookalikes. This is Bombus crotchii or Crotch's bumblebee. This is a, one of those four that are candidates for listing in California. This bee, um, if someone asks me what it, what is what should be the state insect in California, I like to say this species. And um, there are many reasons, but one of them is that it is nearly endemic to the state. 99 plus percent of the records come from the state of California. There are none from Oregon. Uh, there's one from Nevada and about 15 known records from Baja. So it is a Californian. Um, this is a large, really beautiful bee, short velvety hair, short all over. You might notice um, relative to Sitkensis, the one we just saw, this one is almost like it has a crew cut. Uh, it has um, uh, black hair on the face. It will have yellow hair on the vertex and sometimes with a little bit of darker hair mixed in, as in this photo, um, it has a short cheek. This is a distinctly short cheek. Uh, and you see, when you see this bee's face, it's more it's sort of rounded, be, uh, reflecting that very short distance between the compound eye and where the mandibles attach. It um, has black hair across the top of the thorax, and in almost all cases, black hair at the back of the thorax, although we are seeing a few that have some yellow hair there, uh, T1 is mostly black, but can have yellow on its shoulders. And then T2 has uh, a yellow stripe. And in about 75% of these bees, there is reddish hair, orangish hair at the tip of the tail, as in this one. Um, the other 25%, uh, it's black hair there. And um, uh, I have observed while well, excavating the nests of this guy that um, both morphs, if you will, occur in the same nest. So this color uh, distinction does not reflect genetically differentiated populations, for example. Um, so uh, there are some species that look similar to it. One um, is Bombus rufus cinctus, or red-belted bumblebee. The ranges are largely not overlapping, so that's good. Um, this is a highly variable bee in terms of its color pattern, um, and uh, it can look so many different ways. Um, it's largely red on the abdomen in some places and largely black in others. Um, uh, it has a short, short face. That is one thing to look for. It often has an oval of black hair between the wing bases. That instead could be more like a spot or more like a rectangle. But in the vast majority of the bees that I see, it's this really nice, even oval between uh, of black hair between the bases of the wings. Um, the abdomen is variable, but uh, one uh, consistent thing is that T2 almost always has yellow hair in the middle if not on the edges. And here you see a, an example of a bee with T2 yellow medially, medially in the middle, but not on the sides where it's orange. Um, so uh, you could mistake this one for crotches, um, particularly, I guess I'll say, uh, in the Central Valley and around the San Francisco Bay area. Uh, okay, another one that could be confused for crotches is Nevada bumblebee, Bombus nevadensis. This is a large, short-haired bee uh, found mainly east of the Sierras in California and in the northeastern part of the state. Um, it is a high high desert, high plains kind of animal uh, re uh, relative to the other types of habitats we have in California. It is long-cheeked, not short-cheeked. So that's a dead giveaway. It is not crotchy eye. Um, it has, uh, usually has black hair on the face and the vertex. It has a usually a rounded black spot in the middle of the thorax, but is otherwise yellow there. And then it has a lot of yellow hair on the abdomen, usually three segments as depicted here. Um, the reason that it can be mistaken for crotchy eye is, the, is that in a couple of places, it can have red hair and it can have this black and yellow stripiness. Um, so the two images in the upper right hand corner of the cartoon graphics, you see the red tailed morphs. Um, those are only found in two places on earth, so far as we know, 
Humboldt County and San Miguel Island. And so um, if you find a bee that looks like this somewhere else in the state, it's likely to be Crotchii, not this one. But uh, we have seen examples of this bee in recent times in Humboldt County looking just like Crotch's bumblebee. So this is a tricky one um, and it has fooled me and it could fool you. <laughs> Uh, okay, moving on to uh, the fourth candidate for listing. This is Suckley Cuckoo Bumblebee. So this is one of those cuckoos. We're looking at a female here, not a queen, because there's no social behavior within her own colony. She's not um, commanding her daughters to do certain things. Um, so look at that hind leg. There is no uh, pollen basket. Instead, we see um, a somewhat dilated or widened segment, but it's all hairy and sort of stippled in the middle and weak bristles on the side. So female, no pollen carrying apparatus. Uh, this bee uh, will have black facial hair. She'll have yellow uh, hair across the front of the thorax, in, including below the wing bases, as that arrow is indicating. And then they often have uh, a yellow stripe on T4 uh, um, and some yellow sometimes on adjacent segments on the sides. Uh, they have a really unusual distinctive uh, morphology to the place where the genitalia are stored at the very end of the abdomen. And um, basically the plate on the sternal side is longer than the plate on the uh, dorsal side where the T turga turgites are. And so um, from the top looking down, you can see the underside poking out the bottom. Um, I don't have a photo to show you right now. Um, and we probably don't need to worry about it because this is an extremely rare species um, in the US, in the continental US. Um, hasn't been seen in the continental US very much in the last 20 years. Um, it is likely, well, I think it's probably, it may well be gone from California, but we are looking for it in the Northern mountains. Okay, here's just one species that could be confused with Suckley bumblebee. This is another cuckoo bumblebee. So broadly similar in sort of morphology stuff. Um, this one, uh, Insularis or indiscriminate cuckoo bumblebee has yellow facial hair. Not usually entirely yellow, but there's usually a distinctive patch right between the eyes as in this photograph. Um, and so remember Suckley did not have that. It has black facial hair. Okay, uh, and then this bee will have black hair across the top of the thorax, um, sometimes with yellow hair at the end of the, the backside of the thorax and sometimes just black. It will usually have, almost always has yellow hair uh, on T3, 4, 5, um, as uh, depicted in the images there. Um, and you can actually see the tip of the tail on this on this bee, and you can see the two plates I was talking about with Suckley bumblebee. And notice that the, the dorsal one is just a tiny bit longer than the ventral one. In the case of Suckley eye, it's the other way around, and you'd see the, the, the sternal segments sticking out on the underside of the dorsal one. So um, there are some strong differences between the two species, um, but there are some intermediate individuals that are really challenging. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. And um, we do not have time to take questions uh, about this third module. However, as I said before, I'm going to uh, download those questions, type out answers. Um, I'm going to provide them to you and I will be uh, doing this for all three of the workshops. So we will develop a sort of uh, frequently asked questions document, which um, I'll, I'll put on the website so everybody can, can get access to it. And I will let you know about that. If you have any questions, um, please go uh, email me at cabumblebeeatlas at xerces.org. And the last uh, thing I want to say is, is your next step. So if you've taken this training tonight, you are ready to have to take the quiz. And then to um, it, when you pass the quiz, you become uh, named on our scientific collecting permit. And you are and you'll get an email with permits and you are ready to survey. So uh, the quiz is linked on the uh, on the website in several places. One of them is the Adopt a Grid Cell page. So if you go and read the content there, there's a link to this quiz. Um, and uh, it's you're going to have to watch a, a short video about environmental compliance. And then you'll answer a few questions that are based on this material. And that should do it. Um, if you don't get a high enough score, uh, you can take it again. And um, you can keep taking it again until you pass. It's not very hard if you were paying attention. So um, again, thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you soon at a field event.